Act One of Women Beware Women. A Tragedy by Thomas Middleton. Dramatis Personae. The Duke of Florence. Read by Algie Pug. Lord Cardinal, brother to the Duke. Read by Chuck Williamson. Fabrizio, father to Isabella. Read by Martin Geeson. Hippolito, brother to Fabrizio. Read by Alan Mapstone. Guardiano, uncle to the foolish ward. Read by Noel Badrian. The ward, a rich young heir. Read by Nathaniel W. C. Higgins. Leontio, a factor, husband to Bianca. Read by David Nicol. Sordido, the ward's man. Read by M.B. Livia, sister to Fabrizio and Hippolito. Read by Elizabeth Clatt. Isabella, daughter to Fabrizio. Read by Amanda Friday. Bianca, Leontio's wife. Read by Ariel Lipshaw. Mother to Leontio, a widow. Read by Christine G. First boy, first lady, and Hebe. Read by April Gonzalez. Second boy, second lady. Read by Elizabeth Clett. Third boy, gentleman, page, and lord. Read by Robert Hoffman. Citizen, servant, and hymen. Read by Chuck Williamson. Apprentice, messenger, and Ganymede. Read by Avaii. Narrated by Elizabeth Clett. Act One, Scene One. Enter Leontio with Bianca and his mother. Thy sight was never more precious to me. Welcome, with all the affection of a mother, that comfort can express from natural love, since thy birth joy, a mother's chiefest gladness after she's undergone her curse of sorrows. Thou wast not more dear to me than this hour presents thee to my heart. Welcome again. Aside. Alas, poor affectionate soul, how her joys speak to me. I have observed it often, and I know it is the fortune, commonly, of knavish children to have the lovingest mothers. What's this gentlewoman? Oh, you have named the most unvalued purchase that youth of man had ever knowledge of. As often as I look upon that treasure, and know it to be mine, there lies the blessing. It joys me that I ever was ordained to have a being and to live amongst men, which is a fearful living, and a poor one, let a man truly think on't. To have the toils and griefs of fourscore years put up in a white sheet tied with two knots, methinks it should strike earthquakes in adulterers, where e'en the very sheets they commit sin in may prove, for all they know, all their last garments. Oh, what a mark were there for women then! But beauty, able to content a conqueror, whom earth could scarce content, keeps me in compass. I find no wish in me bent sinfully to this man's sister or to that man's wife. In love's name, let em keep their honesties and cleave to their own husbands. Tis their duties. Now, when I go to church, I can pray handsomely nor come like gallants only to see faces, as if lust went to market still on Sundays. I must confess, I am guilty of one sin, mother, more than I brought into the world with me, but that I glory in. Tis theft, but noble as ever greatness yet shut up with all. How's that? Never to be repented, mother, though sin be death. I had died if I had not sinned, and here's my masterpiece. Do you now behold her? Look on her well. She's mine. Look on her better. Now, say, if it be not the best piece of theft that ever was committed. And I have my pardon for it. Tis sealed from heaven by marriage. Married to her? Yet you must keep counsel, mother. I'm undone else. If it be known... Off lost her. Do but think now what that loss is. Life's but a trifle to it. From Venice, 
her consent and i have brought her from parents great in wealth more now in rage but let storms spend their furies now we've got a shelter o'er our quiet innocent loves we're contented little money she's brought me view but her face you may see all her dowry save that which lies locked up in hidden virtues like jewels kept in cabinets you're to blame if your obedience will give way to a check to wrong such a perfection how such a creature to draw her from her fortune which no doubt at the full time might have proved rich and noble you know not what you have done my life can give you but little helps and my death lesser hopes and hitherto your own means has but made shift to keep you single and that hardly too what ableness have you to do her right then in maintenance fitting her birth and virtues which every woman of necessity looks for and most to go above it not confined by their conditions virtues bloods or births but flowing to affections wills and humours aside to his mother speak low sweet mother you're able to spoil as many as come within the hearing if it be not your fortune to mar all i have much marvel i pray you do not teach her to rebel when she's in a good way to obedience to rise with other women in commotion against their husbands for six gowns a year and so maintain their cause when they're once up in all things else that require cost enough they are all of them a kind of spirits soon raised but not so soon laid mother as for example a woman's belly is got up in a trice a simple charge ere it be laid down again so ever in all their quarrels and their courses and i am a proud man i hear nothing of them they're very still i thank my happiness and sound asleep pray let not your tongue waken if you can but rest quiet she's contented with all conditions that my fortunes bring her to to keep close as a wife that loves her husband to go after the rate of my ability not the licentious swinge of her own will like some of her old schoolfellows she intends to take out other works in a new sampler and frame the fashion of an honest love which knows no wants but mocking poverty brings forth more children to make rich men wonder at divine providence that feeds mouths of infants and sends them none to feed but stuffs their rooms with fruitful bags their beds with barren wombs good mother make you not things worse than they are out of your too much openness pray take heed on't nor imitate the envy of old people that strive to mar good sport because they are perfect i would have you more pitiful to youth especially to your own flesh and blood i'll prove an excellent husband here's my hand lay in provision follow my business roundly and make you a grandmother in forty weeks go pray salute her bid her welcome cheerfully gentlewoman salutes her thus much is a debt of courtesy which fashionable strangers pay each other at a kind of meeting then there's more than one due to the knowledge i have of your nearness i am bold to come again and now salute you by the name of a daughter which may challenge more than ordinary respect salutes her again aside why this is well now and i think few mothers of free score will mend it what i can bid you welcome to is mean but make it all your own we are full of wants and cannot welcome worth aside now this is scurvy and spoke as if a woman lacked her teeth these old folks talk of nothing but defects because they grow so full of them themselves kind mother there is nothing can be wanting to her that does enjoy all her desires heaven send a quiet peace with this man's love and i am as rich as virtue can be poor which were enough after the rate of mind to erect temples for content placed here i have forsook friends fortunes and my country and hourly i rejoice in Here's my friends, and few is the good number. To Leontio. Thy successes, howe'er they look, I will still name my fortunes. Hopeful or spiteful, they shall all be welcome. Who invites many guests, has of all sorts, as he that traffics much, drinks of all fortunes. Yet they must all be welcome and used well. 
I'll call this place the place of my birth now, and rightly too, for here my love was born, and that's the birthday of a woman's joys. You have not bid me welcome since I came. That I did, questionless. No sure? How wast? I have quite forgot it. Thus. Kisses her. Oh, sir, tis true. Now I remember well. I have done thee wrong. Pray take it again, sir. Kisses him. How many of these wrongs could I put up in an hour, and turn up the glass for twice as many more? Will't please you to walk in, daughter? Thanks, sweet mother. The voice of her that bear me is not more pleasing. Axiant. Though my own care and my rich master's trust lay their commands both on my factorship, this day and night I'll know no other business but her and her dear welcome. Tis a bitterness to think upon to-morrow, that I must leave her still to the sweet hopes of the week's end, that pleasure should be so constrained and curbed after the course of a rich workmaster that never pays till Saturday night. Mary, he comes together in a round sum then, and does more good, you'll say. O oh, fair-eyed Florence, didst thou but know what a most matchless jewel thou art now mistress of, a pride would take thee able to shoot destruction through the bloods of all thy youthful sons. But tis great policy to keep choice treasures in obscurest places. Should we show thieves our wealth to make them bolder? Temptation is a devil will not stick to fasten upon a saint. Take heed of that. The jewel is cased up from all men's eyes. Who could imagine now a gem were kept of that great value under this plain roof? But how in times of absence? What assurance of this restraint then? Yes, yes, there's one with her. Old mothers know the world, and such as these, when sons lock chests, are good to look to keys. Scene 2. Enter Guardiano. Fabrizio, and Livia. What? Has your daughter seen him yet? Know you that? No matter. She shall love him. Nay, let's have fair play. He has been now, my ward, some fifteen year, and tis my purpose, as time calls upon me, by custom seconded, and such moral virtues, to tender him a wife. Now, sir, this wife... I'd fain elect out of a daughter of yours. You see, my meaning's fair. If now this daughter, so tendered, let me come to your own phrase, sir, should offer to refuse him, I were hand -sellered. Aside. Thus am I fain to calculate all my words for the meridian of a foolish old man, to take his understanding. What do you answer, sir? I say still, she shall love him. Yet again? And shall she have no reason for this love? Why, you think that women love with reason? Aside. I perceive fools are not at all hours foolish, no more than wise men wise. I had a wife. She ran mad for me. She had no reason for it, for aught I could perceive. What think you, lady sister? Aside. T'was a fit match, that, being both out of their wits. A loving wife, it seemed. She strove to come as near you as she could. And if her daughter prove not mad for love, too, she takes not after her, nor after me, if she prefer reason before my pleasure. You're an experienced widow, lady sister. I pray let your opinion come amongst us. I must offend you, then, if truth will do it, and take my niece's part, and call it injustice to force her love to one she never saw. Maids should both see and like, all little enough. If they love truly after that, tis well. Counting the time, she takes one man till death. That's a hard task, I tell you. But one may inquire at three years, and amongst young wives, and mark how the game goes. 
why is not man tied to the same observance lady sister and in one woman tis enough for him besides he tastes of many sundry dishes that we poor wretches never lay our lips to as obedience forsooth subjection duty and such kickshaws all of our making but served in to them and if we lick a finger then sometimes we are not to blame your best cooks use it <laughs> thou art a sweet lady sister and a witty a witty oh the bud of commendation fit for a girl of sixteen i am blown man i should be wise by this time and for instance i have buried my two husbands in good fashion and never mean more to marry no why so lady because the third shall never bury me i think i am more than witty how think you sir i have paid often fees to a counsellor as had a weaker brain then i must tell you your money was soon parted lighter now brother where is my niece let her be sent for straight if you have any hope twill prove a wedding tis fit to faith she should have one sight of him and stop upon it and not be joined in haste as if they went to stock a new-found land look out her uncle and you're sure of her those two are ne'er asunder they've been heard in argument at midnight moonshine nights are noondays with them they walk out their sleeps or rather at those hours appear like those that walk in em for so they did to me look you i told you truth they're like a chain draw but one link all follows <laughs> enter hippolyto and isabella o oh, affinity what piece of excellent workmanship art thou tis work clean wrought for there's no lust but love in it and that abundantly when in stranger things there is no love at all but what lust brings on with your mask for tis your part to see now and not be seen go to make use of your time see what you mean to like nay and i charge you like what you see do you hear me there's no dallying the gentleman's almost twenty and tis time he were getting lawful heirs and you are breeding on em good father tell me not of tongues and rumours you say the gentleman is somewhat simple the better for a husband were you wise for those that marry fools live ladies lives on with the mask i'll hear no more he's rich the fools hid under bushels not so hid neither but here's a foul great piece of him methinks what will he be when he comes all together enter the ward with a trap-stick and sordido his man beat him i beat him out of the field with his own cat-stick yet gave him the first hand oh strange i did it then he set jacks on me what my lady's tailor ay and i beat him too nay that's no wonder he's used to beating nay i tickled him when i came once to my tippings now you talk on em there was a poulterer's wife made a great complaint of you last night to your gardener that you struck a bump in her child's head as big as an egg an egg may prove a chicken then in time the poulterer's wife will get by it when i am in game i am furious came my mother's eyes in my way i would not lose a fair end no were she alive but with one tooth in her head i should venture the striking out of that i think of nobody when i am in play i am so earnest codes me my gardener prithee lay up my cat and cat stick safe where sir in the chimney corner chimney corner yes sir your cats were always safe in the chimney corner unless they burn their coats mary that i am afraid on why then i'll bestow your cat in the gutter and there she's safe i'm sure if i but live to keep a house i'll make thee a great man if meat and drink can do it i can stoop gallantly and pitch out when i list i'm dog at a hole 
I marvel my gardener does not seek a wife for me. I protest I'll have a bout with the maids else, or contract myself at midnight to the larder woman, in presence of a fool and a sack posset. Ward. I feel myself, after any exercise, horribly prone. Let me but ride. I'm lusty, a cock-horse, straight of faith. Why, Ward, I say. I'll forswear eating eggs on moonshine nights. There's ne'er a one I eat but turns into a cock in four and twenty hours. If my hot blood be not took down in time, sure it will crow shortly. Do you hear, sir? Follow me. I must new school you. School me? I scorn that now. I am past schooling. I am not so base to learn to write and read. I was born to better fortunes in my cradle. Exit. Ah, how do you like him, girl? This is your husband. Like him or like him not, wench. You shall have him, and you shall love him. O oh, soft there, brother. Though you be a justice, your warrant cannot be served out of your liberty. You may compel, out of the power of a father, things merely harsh to a maid's flesh and blood. But when you come to love, there the soil alters. You're in another country, where your laws are no more set by than the cacklings of geese in Rome's great capital. Marry him she shall, then. Let her agree upon love afterwards. Exit. Oh, you speak now, brother, like an honest mortal, that walks upon the earth with a staff. You were up in the clouds before. You'd command love, and so do most old folks that go without it. To Hippolito, my best and dearest brother, I could dwell here. There is not such another seat on earth where all good parts better express themselves. You'll make me blush anon. Tis but like saying grace before a feast, then, and that most comely. Thou art all a feast, and she that has thee a most happy guest. Prithee, cheer up thy niece with special counsel. Exit. Aside. I would to fit to speak to her what I would, but t'was not a thing ordained, heaven has forbid it. And tis most meet that I should rather perish than the decree divine receive least blemish. Feed inward, you my sorrows, make no noise, consume me silent, let me be stark dead ere the world know I'm sick. You see my honesty if you befriend me so. Aside. Marry a fool? Can't there be a greater misery to a woman that means to keep her days true to her husband and know no other man? So virtue wills it. Why, how can I obey and honour him, but I must needs commit idolatry? A fool is but the image of a man, and that but ill made neither. Oh, the heart-breakings of miserable maids where love's enforced! The best condition is but bad enough. When women have their choices, commonly they do but buy their thraldoms, and bring great portions to men to keep em in subjection, as if a fearful prisoner should bribe the keeper to be good to him, yet lies in still, and glad of a good usage, a good look sometimes. By our lady, no misery surmounts a woman's. Men buy their slaves, but women buy their masters. Yet honesty and love makes all this happy, and next to angels the most blessed estate. That providence, that has made every poison good for some use, and sets four warring elements at peace in man, can make a harmony in things that are most strange to human reason. Oh, but this marriage! What? Are you sad too, uncle? Faith, then there's a whole household down together. Where shall I go to seek my comfort, now when my best friend's distressed? What is afflicts you, sir? Faith, nothing but one grief that will not leave me, and now tis welcome. Every man has something to bring him to his end, and this will serve, joined with your father's cruelty to you, that helps it forward. Oh, be cheered, sweet uncle. How long hast been upon you? I ne'er spied it. What a dull sight have I! How long, I pray, sir? Since I first saw you, niece, and left Bologna. And could you deal so unkindly with my heart, to keep it up so long hid from my pity? Alas! How shall I trust your love hereafter? Have we passed through so many arguments, and missed of that still, the most needful one? 
waked out whole nights together in discourses, and the main point forgot. We are to blame both. This is an obstinate, while for forgetfulness, and faulty on both parts. Let's lose no time now. Begin, good uncle. You that feel't, what is it? You of all creatures, niece, must never hear on't. Tis not a thing ordained for you to know. Not I, sir. All my joys that word cuts off. You made profession once you loved me best. Twas but profession. Yes, I do it too truly, and fear I shall be chid for it. Know the worst, then. I love thee dearlier than an uncle can. Why, so you ever said, and I believed it. Aside. So simple is the goodness of her thoughts. They understand not yet the unhallowed language of a near sinner. I must yet be forced, though blushes be my venture, to come nearer. As a man loves his wife, so love I thee. What's that? Methought I heard ill news come toward me, which commonly we understand too soon, then over quick at hearing. I'll prevent it, though my joys fare the harder. Welcome it. It shall ne'er come so near mine ear again. Farewell, all friendly solaces and discourses. I'll learn to live without ye, for your dangers are greater than your comforts. What's become of truth in love, if such we cannot trust, when blood, that should be love, is mixed with lust? Exit. The worst can be but death, and let it come. He that lives joyless, every day's his doom. Exit. Scene three. Enter Leontio alone. Methinks I'm e'en as dull now at departure as men observe great gallants the next day after a revel. You shall see em look much of my fashion if you mark em well. Tis e'en a second hell to part from pleasure when man has got a smack on't. As many holidays coming together make your poor heads idle a great while after, and are said to stick fast in their fingers' ends, e'en so does game in a new married couple. For the time it spoils all thrift, and indeed lies abed to invent all the new ways for great expenses. Bianca and his mother discovered standing at a window above. See, and she be not got on purpose now into the window to look after me. I have no power to go now, and I shall be hanged. Farewell, all business. I desire no more than I see yonder. Let the goods at key look to themselves. Why should I toil my youth out? It is but begging two or three years sooner, and stay with her continually. Is to match? Fie! What a religion have I leapt into? Get out again for shame. The man loves best when he cares most. That shows his zeal to love. Fondness is but the idiot to affection that plays at hot cockles with rich merchants' wives, good to make sport withal when the chest's full and the long warehouse cracks. Tis time of day for us to be more wise. Tis early with us, and if they lose the morning of their affairs, they commonly lose the best part of the day. Those that are wealthy and have got enough, tis after sunset with them. They may rest, grow fat with ease, banquet and toy and play, when such as I enter the heat of the day. And I'll do it cheerfully. I perceive, sir, you're not gone yet. I have good hope you'll stay now. Farewell. I must not. Come, come, pray return. Tomorrow, adding but a little care more, we'll dispatch all as well. Believe me, twill, sir. I could well wish myself where you would have me. But love that's wanton must be ruled a while by that that's careful, or all goes to ruin. As fitting is a government in love as in a kingdom. Where tis all mere lust, tis like an insurrection in the people that, raised in self-will, wars against all reason. But love that is respective for increase is like a good king that keeps all in peace. Once more farewell. But this one night, I prithee. Alas, I'm in for twenty if I stay, and then for forty. I have such luck to flesh, I never bought a horse, but he bore double. If I stay any longer, I shall turn an everlasting spendthrift. As you love to be maintained well, do not call me again, for then I shall not care which end goes forward. Again, farewell to thee. Exit. Since it must, farewell too. Faith, daughter, you're to blame. You take the course to make him an ill husband. Troth you do, and that disease is catching, I can tell you. 
ay, and soon taken by a young man's blood, and that with little urging. Nay, fie, see now, what cause have you to weep? Would I had no more, that have lived threescore years, there were a cause, and to a well thought on, trust me, you are to blame. His absence cannot last five days at utmost. Why should those tears be fetched forth? Cannot love, being as well expressed in a good look, but it must see her face still in a fountain. It shows like a country maid dressing her head by a dish of water. Come, tis an old custom to weep for love. Enter two or three boys, and a citizen or two with an apprentice. Now they come, now they come. The Duke! The States! How near, boy? Ay, the next street, sir. Hard at hand. You, Sarah, get a standing for your mistress, the best in all the city. I have it for her, sir. Twas a thing I provided for her overnight. Tis ready at her pleasure. Fetch her to it, then. Away, sir. What's the meaning of this hurry? Can you tell, mother? What a memory have I, I see by that years come upon me. Why, tis a yearly custom and solemnity, religiously observed by the Duke and State to St. Mark's Temple, the 15th of April. See if my dull brains had not quite forgot it. Twas happily questioned of thee, I had gone down else, sat down like a drone below, and never thought on't. I would not to be ten years younger again, that you had lost a sight. Now you shall see your Duke, a goodly gentleman of his years. Is he old, then? About some fifty-five. That's no great age in man. He's then at his best for wisdom and for judgment. The Lord Cardinal, his noble brother, there's a comely gentleman, and greater in devotion than in blood. He's worthy to be marked. You shall behold all our chief states of Florence. He came fortunately against this solemn day. I hope so, always. Music. I hear him near us now. Do you stand easily? Exceeding well, good mother. Take this stool. I need it not, I thank you. Use your will, then. Enter in great solemnity six knights bareheaded, then two cardinals, and then the lord cardinal, then the duke. After him the states of Florence by two and two, with variety of music and song. Exeunt. How like you it, daughter? Tis a noble state. Methinks my soul could dwell upon the reverence of such a solemn and most worthy custom. Did not the duke look up? Methought he saw us. That's every one's conceit that sees a duke. If he looks steadfastly, he looks straight at them. When he, perhaps, good careful gentleman, never minds any, but the look he casts is at his own intentions, and his object only the public good. Most likely so. Come, come, we'll end this argument below. Exeunt. End of Act One. Act Two. Scene One. Enter Hippolito, and Lady Livia, the widow. A strange affection, brother. When I think on't, I wonder how thou cam'st by it. Even as easily as man comes by destruction, which oft times he wears in his own bosom. Is the world so populous in women, and creation so prodigal in beauty, and so various? Yet does love turn thy point to thine own blood? Tis somewhat too unkindly. Must thy eye dwell evilly on the fairness of thy kindred, and seek not where it should? It is confined now in a narrower prison than was made for it. It is allowed a stranger, and where bounty is made to the great man's honour, tis ill husbandry to spare, and servants shall have small thanks for it. So he heaven's bounty seems to scorn and mock that spares free means, and spends of his own stock. Ne'er was man's misery so soon sewed up, counting how truly. Nay, I love you so, that I shall venture much to keep a change from you, so fearful as this grief will bring upon you. Faith, it even kills me when I see you faint under a reprehension, and I'll leave it, though I know nothing can be better for you. Prithee, sweet brother, let not passion waste the goodness of thy time, and of thy fortune. Thou keep'st the treasure of that life I love as dearly as mine own. And if you think my former words too bitter, which were ministered by truth and zeal, tis but a hazarding of grace and virtue, 
and I can bring forth as pleasant fruits as sensuality wishes in all her teeming longings. This I can do. Oh, nothing that can make my wishes perfect. I would that love of yours were pawned to it, brother, and as soon lost that way as I could win. Sir, I could give as shrewd a lift to chastity as any she that wears a tongue in Florence. She'd need be a good horsewoman, and sit fast, whom my strong argument could not fling at last. Prithee, take courage, man. Though I should counsel another to despair, yet I am pitiful to thy afflictions, and will venture hard. I will not name for what. It is not handsome. Find you the proof, and praise me. Then I fear me I shall not praise you in haste. This is the comfort. You are not the first, brother, has attempted things more forbidden than this seems to be. I'll minister all cordials now to you, because I'll cheer you up, sir. I'm past hope. Love, thou shalt see me do a strange cure, then, as e'er was wrought on a disease so mortal and near akin to shame. When shall you see her? Never in comfort more. You're so impatient, too. Will you believe? Death, she hath forsworn my company, and sealed it with a blush. So, I perceive all lies upon my hands, then. Well, the more glory when the work's finished. How now, sir, the news? Enter servant. Madam, your niece, the virtuous Isabella, is lighted now to see you. That's great fortune. Sir, your stars bless you. Simple, lead her in. Exit servant. What's this to me? Your absence, gentle brother. I must bestir my wits for you. Aye, to great purpose. Exit Hippolito. Beshrew you. Would I loved you not so well? I'll go to bed and leave this deed undone. I am the fondest where I once affect, the carefulest of their healths and of their case, forsooth that I look still but slenderly to mine own. I take a course to pity him so much now that I have none left for modesty and myself. This tis to grow so liberal. You few sisters that love their brother's case above their own honesties. But if you question my affections, that will be found my fault. Enter Isabella. Niece, your love's welcome. Alas! what draws that paleness to thy cheeks? This enforced marriage towards? It helps, good aunt, amongst some other griefs. But those I'll keep locked up in modest silence, for their sorrows would shame the tongue more than they grieve the thought. Indeed, the ward is simple. Simple? That were well. Why, one might make good shift with such a husband, but he's a fool entailed. He halts downright in and knowing this, I hope tis at your choice to take or refuse, niece. You see it is not. I loathe him more than beauty can hate death, or age her spiteful neighbour. Let it appear, then. How can I, being born with that obedience, that must submit under a father's will? If he command, I must of force consent. Alas, poor soul! Be not offended, prithee, if I set by the name of niece a while, and— Bring in pity in a stranger fashion. It lies here in this breast, would cross this match. How? Cross it, aunt. Aye, and give thee more liberty than thou hast reason yet to apprehend. Sweet aunt, in goodness keep not hid from me what may befriend my life. Yes, yes, I must when I return to reputation, and think upon the solemn vow I made to your dead mother, my most loving sister. As long as I've her memory twixt mine eyelids, look for no pity now. Kind, sweet, dear aunt. No, twas a secret I have took special care of, delivered by your mother on her deathbed. That's nine years now, and I'll not part from it yet, though ne'er was fitter time nor greater cause for it. As you desire the praises of a virgin. Good sorrow! I would do thee any kindness not wronging secrecy your reputation. Neither of which, as I have hope of fruitfulness, shall receive wrong from me. Nay, twould be your own wrong. As much as any, should it come to that once. 
I need no better means to work persuasion, then. Let it suffice. You may refuse this fool, or you may take him as you see occasion for your advantage. The best wits will do it. You've liberty enough in your own will. You cannot be enforced. There grows the flower, if you could pick it out, makes whole life sweet to you. That which you call your father's commands are nothing. Then your obedience must needs be as little. If you can make shift here to taste your happiness, or pick out aught that likes you, much good do you. You see your cheer. I'll make you no set dinner. And trust me, I may starve for all the good I can find yet in this. Sweet aunt, deal plainlier. Say, I should trust you now upon an oath, and give you in a secret that would start you. How am I sure of you in faith and silence? Equal assurance may I find in mercy, as you for that in me. It shall suffice. Then know, however custom has made good for reputation's sake, the names of niece and aunt twixt you and I were nothing less. How's that? I told you I should start your blood. You are no more allied to any of us, save what the courtesy of opinion casts upon your mother's memory and your name, than the merest stranger is, or one begot at Naples when the husband lies at Rome. There's so much odds betwixt us. Since your knowledge wished more instruction, and I have your oath in pledge for silence, it makes me talk the freelier. Did ne'er the report of that famed Spaniard, Marquis of Coria, since your time was ripe for understanding, fill your ear with wonder? Yes, what of him? I have heard his deeds of honour often related when we lived in Naples. You heard the praises of your father, then? My father? That was he. But all the business so carefully and so discreetly carried, that fame received no spot by it. Not a blemish. Your mother was so wary to her end, none knew it but her conscience and her friend. Till penitent confession made it mine, and now my pity yours. It had been long else, and I hope care and love alike in you, made good by oath, will see it take no wrong now. How weak his commands now whom you call father! How vain all his enforcements your obedience! And what a largeness in your will and liberty to take or to reject, or to do both! For fools will serve to father wise men's children. All this you've time to think on. Oh, my wench! Nothing o'erthrows our sex but indiscretion. We might do well else of a brittle people as any under the great canopy. I pray forget not but to call me aunt still. Take heed of that. It may be marked in time else. But keep your thoughts to yourself from all the world, kindred, or dearest friend. Nay, I entreat you from him that all this while you have called uncle. And though you love him dearly, as I know his deserts claim as much e'en from a stranger, yet let not him know this. I prithee do not. As ever thou hast hope of second pity, if thou shouldst stand in need on't, do not do it. Believe my oath, I will not. Why, well said. Aside, who shows more craft to undo a maiden head, I'll resign my part to her. To Hippolito, as he is entering, she's thine own. Go. To Livia. Alas, fair flattery cannot cure my sorrows. Exit Livia. Aside. Have I passed so much time in ignorance, and never had the means to know myself till this blessed hour? Thanks to her virtuous pity that brought it now to light. But I had known it but one day sooner. He had then received in favours what, poor gentleman, he took in bitter words, a slight and harsh reward for one of his deserts. Aside. There seems to me now more anger and distraction in her looks. I'm gone. I'll not endure a second storm. The memory of the first is not past yet. Aside. Are you returned, you comforts of my life? In this man's presence I will keep you fast now, and sooner part eternally from the world than my good joys in you. To Hippolito. Prithee, forgive me. 
I did but chide and jest. The best loves use it sometimes. It sets an edge upon affection. When we invite our best friends to a feast, tis not all sweetmeats that we set before them. They're somewhat sharp and salt, both to whet appetite, and make them taste their wine well. So, methinks, after a friendly, sharp, and savoury chiding, a kiss tastes wondrous well, and full of the grape. How thinkest thou? Dost not? Kisses him. Tis so excellent, I know not how to praise it. What to say to it? This marriage shall go forward. With the ward? Are you in earnest? Twould be ill for us else. Aside. For us? How mean she that? Troth, I begin to be so well, methinks, within this hour, for all this match, able to kill one's heart. Nothing can hold me down now. Should my father provide a worse fool yet, which I should think were a hard thing to compass, I'd have him either, the worse the better. None can come amiss now, if he want wit enough. So discretion love me, desert and judgment I have content sufficient. She that comes once to be a housekeeper must not look every day to farewell, sir, like a young waiting gentlewoman in service, for she feeds commonly as her lady does. No good bit passes her, but she gets a taste on't. But when she comes to keep house for herself, she's glad of some choice cates than once a week, or twice at most, and glad if she can get em. So must affection learn to fare with thankfulness. Pray make your love no stranger, sir, that's all. Aside. Though you be one yourself, and know not aunt, and I have sworn you must not. Exit. This is beyond me. Never came joy so unexpectedly to meet desires in man. How came she thus? What has she done to her? Can any tell? Tis beyond sorcery, this, drugs or love-powders. Some art that hast no name, sure, strange to me of all the wonders I e'er met with all throughout my ten years' travel. But I'm thankful for it. This marriage now must of necessity forward. It is the only veil wit can devise to keep our axe hid from sin-piercing eyes. Exit. Scene 2. Livia's house. A chess-board is set out. Enter Guardiano and Livia. How, sir? A gentlewoman so young, so fair as you set forth, spied from the widow's window? She. Our Sunday dinner woman? And Thursday supper woman, the same still. I know not how she came by her, but I'll swear she's the prime gallant for a face in Florence, and no doubt other parts follow their leader. The duke himself first spied her at the window. Then in a rapture, as if admiration were poor when it were single, beckoned me and pointed to the wonder warily, as one that feared she would draw in her splendour too soon, if too much gazed at. I ne'er knew him so infinitely taken with a woman, nor can I blame his appetite, or tax his raptures of slight folly. She's a creature able to draw a state from serious business, and make it their best piece to do her service. What course shall we devise? Taz spoke twice now. Twice? Tis beyond your apprehension how strangely that one look has catched his heart. Twould prove but too much worth in wealth and favour to those should work his peace. And if I do it not, or at least come as near it, if your art will take a little pains and second me, as any wench in Florence of my standing, I'll quite give o'er and shut up shop in cunning. Tis for the Duke. And if I fail your purpose, all means to come by riches or advancement, miss me, and skip me over. Let the old woman, then, be sent for with all speed. Then I'll begin. A good conclusion follow, and a sweet one, after this stale beginning with old ware. Within there. Enter servant. Sir, do you call? Come near. List hither. Whispers. I long myself to see this absolute creature that wins the heart of love and praise so much. Go, sir, make haste. Say I entreat her company. Do you hear, sir? Yes, madame. Exit. That brings her quickly. I would twere done. The duke waits the good hour, and I wait the good fortune that may spring from't. 
I have had a lucky hand these fifteen year at such court passage with three dice in a dish. Signor Fabrizio. Enter Fabrizio. Ah, sir, I bring an alteration in my mouth now. An alteration? Aside. No wise speech, I hope. He means not to talk wisely, does he, Trow? Good. What's the change, I pray, sir? A new change. Another yet? Faith, there's enough already. My daughter loves him now. What? Does she, sir? Affects him beyond thought. Who but the ward, forsooth? No talk but of the ward. She would have him to choose above all the men she ever saw my will goes not so fast as her consent now her duty gets before my command still why then sir if you'll have me speak my thoughts i smell twill be a match ay and a sweet young couple if i have any judgment aside faith that's little let her be sent to-morrow before noon and handsomely tricked up for about that time i mean to bring her in and tender her to him i warrant you for handsome i will see her things laid ready every one in order and have some part of her tricked up to-night why well said twas a use her mother had when she was invited to an early wedding she'd dress her head all night sponge up herself and give her neck three lathers aside ne'er a halter on with her chain of pearl her ruby bracelets lay ready all her tricks and diggum bobs so must your daughter i'll about it straight sir exit fabrizio how he sweats in the foolish zeal of fatherhood after six ounces an hour and seems to toil as much as if his cares were wise ones you've let his folly blood in the right vein lady and here comes his sweet son-in-law that shall be they're both allied in wit before the marriage what will they be hereafter when they are nearer yet they can go no further than the fool there's the world's end in both of em enter ward and sordido one with a shuttlecock the other a battle door. Now, young heir. What's the next business after Shuttlecock now? Tomorrow you shall see the gentlewoman must be your wife. There's e'en another thing, too, must be kept up with a pair of battle doors. My wife, what can she do? Nay, that's a question you should ask yourself, Ward, when you're alone together. That's as I list. A wife's to be asked anywhere, I hope. I'll ask her in a congregation, if I have a mind to it, and so save a license. My gardener has no more wit than an herb-woman that sells away all her sweet herbs and nosegays, and keeps a stinking breath for her own pottage. Let me be at the choosing of your beloved, if you desire a woman of good parts. Thou shalt, sweet Sordido. I have a plaguey guess. Let me alone to see what she is. If I but look upon her, way, I know all the faults to a hair that you may refuse her for. Dost thou? I prithee, let me hear em, Sordido. Well, mark em, then. I have em all in rhyme. The wife your gardener ought to tender Should be pretty, straight, and slender, Her hair not short, her foot not long, Her hand not huge, nor too too loud her tongue, No pearl in eye, nor ruby in her nose, No burner cut but what the catalogue shows. She must have teeth, and that no black ones, and kiss most sweet when she does smack ones. Her skin must be both white and plump, her body straight, not hopper rumped, or wriggle sideways like a crab. She must be neither slut nor drab, nor go to splayfoot with her shoes to make her smock lick up the dews. And two things more, which I forgot to tell you, she neither must have bump in back nor belly. These are the faults that will not make her pass. And if I spy not these, I am a rank ass. <laughs> Nay, more. By right, sir, you should see her naked, for that's the ancient order. See her naked? That were good sport, of faith. I'll have the books turned over, 
and if I find her naked on record, she shall not have a rag on. But stay, stay, how if she should desire to see me so too? I were in a sweet case then, such a foul skin. But you've a clean shirt, and that makes amends, sir. I will not see her naked for that trick, though. Exit. Then take her with all her faults with her clothes on. And they may hide a number with a bum roll. Faith, choosing of a wench in a huge farthingale is like the buying of ware under a great penthouse. What with the deceit of one and the false light of the other, mark my speeches, he may have a diseased wench in his bed and rotten stuff in his breeches. Exit. It may take handsomely. Guardiano goes out and returns almost immediately. I see small hindrance. How now, so soon returned? And her mother. She's come. That's well. Widow, come, come, I have a great quarrel to you. Faith, I must chide you, that you must be sent for. You make yourself so strange, never come at us, and yet so near a neighbour and so unkind. Troth, you're to blame. You cannot be more welcome to any house in Florence, that I'll tell you. My thanks must needs acknowledge so much, madam. How can you be so strange, then? I sit here sometimes whole days together without company, when business draws this gentleman from home, and should be happy in society, which I so well affect as that of yours. I know you're alone, too. Why should not we, like two kind neighbours, then, supply the wants of one another, having tongue discourse, experience in the world, and such kind helps to laugh down time and meet age merrily? Age, madam, you speak mirth. Tis at my door, but a long journey from your ladyship yet. My faith! I'm nine and thirty, every stroke, wench. And tis a general observation mongst knights, wives, or widows, we account ourselves then old when young men's eyes leave looking at us. Tis the true rule amongst us, and never failed yet in any, but in one that I remember. Indeed, she had a friend at nine and forty. Marry, she paid well for him, and in the end he kept a queen or two with her own money, that robbed her of her plate and cut her throat. She had her punishment in this world, madam, and a fair warning to all other women that they live chaste at fifty. Ay, or never, wench. Come, now I have thy company, I'll not part with it till after supper. Yes, I must crave pardon, madam. I swear you shall stay supper. We have no strangers, woman, none but my sojourners and I. This gentleman and the young heir, his ward, you know our company. Some other time I will make a bold with you, madam. Nay, pray stay, widow. Faith, she shall not go. Do you think I'll be forsworn? Tis a great while till supper-time. I'll take my leave then now, madam, and come again if the evening, since your ladyship will have it so. If the evening? By my troth, wench, I'll keep you while I have you. You have great business sure to sit alone at home. I wonder strangely what pleasure you take in't. Were it to me now, I should be ever at one neighbour's house or other all day long, having no charge or no one to chide you if you go or stay, who may live merrier, I, or more at heart's ease. Come, we'll to chess, or draughts. There are an hundred tricks to drive out time till supper. Never fear it, wench. I'll but make one step home and return straight, madam. Come, I'll not trust you. You use more excuses to your kind friends than ever I knew any. What business can you have, if you be sure you've locked the doors? And that being all you have, I know you're careful on't. One afternoon so much to spend here. Say I should entreat you now to lie a night or two, or a week with me, or leave your own house for a month together. It were a kindness that long neighbourhood and friendship might well hope to prevail in. Would you deny such a request of faith? Speak truth and freely. I will then uncivil, madam. Go to, then. Set your men. Pointing to the chessboard. We'll have whole nights of mirth together ere we be much older, wench. Aside. As good now, tell her then. 
for she will know it. I have always found her a most friendly lady. Why, widow, where's your mind? Troth, and at home, madame. To tell you truth, I left a gentlewoman and sitting all alone, which is uncomfortable, especially to young bloods. Another excuse? No, as I hope for health, madame, that's the truth. Please you to send and see. What gentlewoman? Pish! Wife to my son, indeed, but not known, madame, to any but yourself. Now I beshrew you. Could you be so unkind to her and me to come and not bring her? Faith, tis not friendly. I feared to be too bold. Too bold? Oh, what's become of the true hearty love was wont to be mongst neighbours in old time? And she's a stranger, madam. The more should be her welcome. When is courtesy in better practice than when tis employed in entertaining strangers? Ah, oh, I could chide a faith. Leave her behind, poor gentlewoman, alone too. Make some amends and send for her betimes. Go. Please, you command one of your servants, madam. Within there. Enter servant. Madam. Attend the gentlewoman. Aside. It must be carried wondrously privately for my son's knowledge. He'll break out in storms else. Hark you, sir. Whispers the servant. Aside to Guardiano. Now comes in the heat of your part. True, I know it, lady. And if I be out, may the duke banish me from all employments, wanton or serious. So, have you sent, widow? Yes, madam. He's almost at home by this. And, faith, let me entreat you, that henceforward all such unkind faults may be swept from friendship, which does but dim the lustre, and think thus much it is a wrong to me that have ability to bid friends welcome, when you keep em from me. You cannot set great dishonour near me, for bounty is the credit and the glory of those that have enough. I see you're sorry, and the good men's is made by it. Here she's, madam. Enter Bianca and servant. Aside. I wonder how she comes to send for me now. Gentlewoman, you're most welcome. Trust me you are, as courtesy can make one, or respect due to the presence of you. I give you thanks, lady. I heard you were alone, and it had appeared an ill condition in me, though I knew you not, nor ever saw you, yet humanity thinks every case her own, to have kept your company here from you, and left you all solitary. I rather ventured upon boldness, then, as the least fault, and wished your presence here. The thing most happily motioned of that gentleman, whom I request you, for his care and pity, to honour and reward with your acquaintance. A gentleman that ladies right stands for. That's his profession. Tis a noble one, and honours my acquaintance. All my intentions are servants to such mistresses. Tis your modesty, it seems, that makes your desert speak so low, sir. Come, widow. To Bianca. Look, you lady, here's our business pointing to the chess-board. Are we not well employed, think you? An old quarrel between us that will never be at an end. No, and methinks there's men enough to part you, lady. Oh, but they set us on. Let us come off as well as we can, poor souls. Men care no farther. I pray, sit down, forsooth, if you have the patience to look upon two weak and tedious gamesters. Faith, madam, set these by till evening. You'll have enough on then. The gentlewoman, being a stranger, would take more delight to see your rooms and pictures. Marry, good sir, and well remembered. I beseech you show em her. That will beguile time well. Pray heartily do, sir. I'll do as much for you. Here, take these keys. Show her the monument, too. And that's a thing every one sees not. You can witness that, widow. And that's worth sight indeed, madam. Kind lady, I fear I came to be a trouble to you. Oh, nothing less, forsooth. And to this courteous gentleman, that wears a kindness in his breast so noble and bounteous to the welcome of a stranger. If you but give acceptance to my service, you do the greatest grace and honour to me that courtesy can merit. I were to blame else, and out of fashion much. I pray you lead, sir. 
After a game or two, we're for you, gentlefolks. We wish no better seconds in society than your discourses, madam, and your partners there. I thank you, Prace. I'll listen to you, sir. Though when you spoke, there came a paltry rook full in my way, and choked up all my game. Exit Guardiano and Bianca. Alas, poor widow, I shall be too hard for thee. You're cunning at a game, I'll be sworn, madam. It will be found so, ere I give you over. She that can place her man well. As you do, madam. As I shall, wench, can never lose her game. Nay, nay, the black king's mine. Cry you mercy, madam. And this my queen? I see it now. Here's a duke will strike a sure stroke for the game anon. Your pawn cannot come back to relieve itself. I know that, madam. You play well the whilst. How she belies her skill! I hold two ducats, I give you check, and mate your white king. Simplicity itself, your saintish king there. Well, ere now, lady. I have seen the fall of subtlety. Jest on. Ay, but simplicity's receives two for one. What remedy but patience? Enter Guardiano and Bianca in a gallery above. Trust me, sir, mine eye ne'er met with fairer ornaments. Nay, livelier, I'm persuaded neither Florence nor Venice can produce. Sir, my opinion takes your part highly. There's a better piece yet than all these. The Duke discovered. Not possible, sir. Believe it. You'll say so when you see it. Turn but your eye now. You're upon it presently. Exit. Oh, sir. He's gone, beauty. Pish, look not after him. He's but a vapour that when the sun appears is seen no more. He takes hold of her. Oh, treachery to honour. Prithee, tremble not. I feel thy breast shake like a turtle panting under a loving hand that makes much on't. Why art so fearful? As I am friend to brightness, there's nothing but respect and honour near thee. You know me, you have seen me. Here's a heart can witness I have seen thee. The more's my danger. The more's thy happiness. Pish! Struggle not, sweet. She struggles to get from him. This strength were excellent employed in love now. But here tis spent amiss. Strive not to seek thy liberty, and keep me still in prison. I faith you shall not out till I am released now. We'll both be freed together, or stay still by it. So is captivity pleasant. Oh, my lord! I am not here in vain. Have but the leisure to think on that, and thou'lt be soon resolved. The lifting of thy voice is but like one that does exalt his enemy, who, proving high, lays all the plots to confound him that raised him. Take warning, I beseech thee. Thou seem'st to me a creature so composed of gentleness and delicate meekness, such as bless the faces of figures that are drawn for goddesses, and makes art proud to look upon her work. I should be sorry the least force should lay an unkind touch upon thee. Oh, my extremity! My lord, what seek you? Love. Tis gone already. I have a husband. That's a single comfort. Take a friend to him. That's a double mischief, or else there's no religion. Do not tremble at fears of thine own making. Nor, great lord, make me not bold with death and deeds of ruin, because they fear not you. Me they must fright. Then am I best in health. Should thunder speak and none regard it, it had lost the name, and were as good be still. I'm not like those that take their soundest sleeps in greatest tempests. Then wake I most, the weather fearfullest, and call for strength to virtue. Sure I think thou know'st the way to please me. I affect a passionate pleading above an easy yielding. But never pitied any... They deserve none that will not pity me. I can command, think upon that. Yet if thou truly knewest the infinite pleasure my affection takes in gentle fair entreatings, when love's businesses are carried courteously twixt heart and heart, 
you'd make more haste to please me. Why should you seek, sir, to take away that you cannot give? But I give better in exchange, wealth, honour. She that is fortunate in a duke's favour lights on a tree that bears all women's wishes. If your own mother saw you pluck fruit there, she would commend your wit and praise the time of your nativity. Take hold of glory. Do not I know you've cast away your life upon necessities, means merely doubtful, to keep you in indifferent health and fashion, a thing I heard too lately, and soon pitied? And can you be so much your beauty's enemy to kiss away a month or two in wedlock, and weep whole years in wants for ever after? Come, play the wise wench, and provide for ever. Let storms come when they list, they find thee sheltered. Should any doubt arise, let nothing trouble thee. Put trust in our love for the managing of all to thy heart's peace. We'll walk together, and show a thankful joy for both our fortunes. Exit above. Did not I say my duke would fetch you over, widow? I think you spoke in earnest when you said it, madam. And my black king makes all the haste he can, too. Well, madam, we may meet with him in time yet. I have given thee blind mate twice. You may see, madam, my eyes begin to fail. I'll swear they do, wench. Enter Guardiano. Aside. I can but smile as often as I think on it. How prettily the poor fool was beguiled! How unexpectedly! It's a witty age. Never were finer snares for women's honesties than are devised in these days. No spider's webs made of a daintier thread than are now practised to catch love's flesh fly by the silver wing. Yet to prepare her stomach by degrees to Cupid's feast, because I saw twas queasy, I showed her naked pictures by the way a bit to stay the appetite. Well, advancement, I venture hard to find thee, if thou comest with a greater title set upon thy crest, I'll take that first cross patiently, and wait until some other comes greater than that. I'll endure all. The game's e'en at the best now. You may see, widow, how all things draw to an end. And so do I, madam. I pray, take some of your neighbours along with you. They must be those are almost twice your years, then, if they be chose fit matches for my time, madam. Has not my duke bestirred himself? Yes, faith, madam, has done me all the mischief in this game. Has showed himself in his kind. In his kind, call you it? I may swear that. Yes, faith, and keep your oath. Aside. Hark, list. There's somebody coming down. Tis she. Enter Bianca. Aside. Now bless me from a blasting. I saw that now, fearful for any woman's eye to look on. Infectious mists and mildews hang at's eyes. The weather of a doomsday dwells upon him. Yet since mine honour's leprous, why should I preserve that fair that caused the leprosy? Come, poison all at once. To Guardiano. Thou, in whose baseness the bane of virtue breeds, I'm bound in soul eternally to curse thy smooth-browed treachery, that wore the fair veil of a friendly welcome, and I a stranger. Think upon't, tis worth it. Murders piled up upon a guilty spirit at his last breath will not lie heavier than this betraying act upon thy conscience. Beware of offering the first fruits to sin. His weight is deadly who commits with strumpets after they have been abased and made for use. If they offend to the death, as wise men know, how much more they than that first make em so? I give thee that to feed on. I'm made bold now. I thank thy treachery. Sin and I'm acquainted, no couple greater. And I'm like that great one, who making politic use of a base villain. He likes the treason well, but hates the traitor. So I hate thee, slave. Well... So the duke love me, I fare not much amiss then. Two great feasts do seldom come together in one day. We must not look for him. What, at it still, mother? You see me sit, Bite. Are you so soon returned? Aside. 
so lively and so cheerful. A good sign, that. You have not seen all since, sure. That have I, mother, the monument and all. I'm so beholding to this kind, honest, courteous gentleman. You'd little think it, mother. Showed me all. Had me from place to place so fashionably. The kindness of some people, how it exceeds. Faith, I have seen that I little thought to see in the morning when I rose. Nay, so I told you. Before you sought, it would prove worth your sight. I give you great thanks for my daughter, sir, and all your kindness towards her. Oh, good widow, much good may do her. Aside. Forty weeks hence, in faith. Enter servant. Now, sir. May it please you, madame, to walk in. Supper's upon the table. Yes, we come. Will't please you, gentlewomen? Thanks, virtuous lady. Aside to Livia. You're a damned bod. I'll follow you forsooth. Pray, take my mother in. Aside. An old ass go with you. This gentleman and I vow not to part. Then get you both before. There lies his art. Axiant. Widow, I'll follow you. Is't so? Damned bored. Are you so bitter? Tis but want of use. Her tender modesty is seasick a little. Being not accustomed to the breaking billow of woman's wavering faith, blown with temptations. Tis but a qualm of honour, twill away. A little bitter for the time, but lasts not. Sin tastes at the first draught like wormwood water. But drunk again, tis nectar ever after. Exit. End of Act Two. Act Three, Scene One. Enter Mother. I would my son would either keep at home, or I were in my grave. She was but one day abroad, but ever since she's grown so cutted. There's no speaking to her, whether the sight of great cheer at my lady's, and such mean fare at home, work discontent in her, I know not, but I'm sure she's strangely altered. I'll never keep daughter-in-law in the house with me again, if I had an hundred. When read I of any that agreed long together, but she and her mother fell out in the first quarter, nay, some time a grudging of a scolding the first week by a lady, so takes the new deceased me thinks in my house. I'm weary of my part. There's nothing likes her. I know not how to please her or late. And here she comes. Enter Bianca. This is the strangest house for all defects as ever gentlewoman made shift withal to pass away her love in. Why is there not a cushion cloth of drawn work, or some fair cut work pinned up in my bedchamber? A silver and gilt casting bottle hung by it. Nay, since I am content to be so kind to you, to spare you for a silver basin and ewer, which one of my fashion looks for of duty, she's never offered under where she sleeps. She talks of nothing here my whole state's not worth. Never a green silk quilt is there of the house, mother, to cast upon my bed? No, by troth is there, nor orange tawny neither. Here's a house for a young gentlewoman to be got with child in. Yes, simple though you make it, there has been three, gotten a year in, since you move me toot, and all as sweet-faced children, and as lovely as you'll be mother of. I will not spare you. What, cannot children be begot, think you, without guilt-casting bottles? Yes, and as sweet ones. The miller's daughter brings forth as white boys, and she that bathes herself with milk and heen flour. Tis an old saying, one may keep good cheer in a mean house, so may true love affect, after the rate of princes in a cottage. Troth, you speak wondrous well for your old house here. "'Twill shortly fall down at your feet to thank you, "'or stoop when you go to bed like a good child to ask you blessing. "'Must I live in want because my fortune matched me with your son? "'Wives do not give away themselves to husbands to the end to be quite cast away. "'They look to be the better used and tendered rather, "'highly are respected and maintained the richer. "'They're well rewarded else for the free gift of their whole life to a husband.' I ask less now than what I had at home when I was a maid, and at my father's house, kept short of that which a wife knows she must have, nay, and will, will, mother, if she be not a fool born, 
and report went of me that I could wrangle for what I wanted when I was two hours old, and by that copy this land still I hold. You hear me, mother. Exit. I too play in me things, and where I somewhat defer when you spake, t'were ne'er a whit the worst of my quietness. Tis the most suddenest, strangest alteration, and the most sublest that e'er wit at threescore was puzzled to find out. I know no cause for it, but she's no more like the gentlewoman at first that I am like her that ne'er lay with a man yet. And she's a very young thing, wherever she been. When she first lighted her, I told her then how mean she should find all things. She was pleased, forsooth. None better. I laid open all defects to her. She was contented still, but the devil's in her. Nothing contents her now. To-night my son promised to be at home. Would he were come once, for I am weary of my charge, and life too. She be served all in silver by her good will. By night and day she hates the name of pewter, more than sick men the noise, or diseased bones that quake at fall of a hammer, seeming to have a fellow-feeling, with at every blow. What cause shall I think on? She frets me so. Exit. Enter Leontio. How near am I now to a happiness that earth exceeds not? Not another like it. The treasures of the deep are not so precious as are the concealed comforts of a man locked up in woman's love. I scent the air of blessings when I come but near the house. What a delicious breath marriage sends forth! The violet bed's not sweeter. Honest wedlock is like a banqueting house built in a garden on which the spring's chaste flowers take delight to cast their modest odours. When base lust, with all her powders, paintings, and best pride, is but a fair house built by a ditch-side. When I behold a glorious, dangerous strumpet sparkling in beauty and destruction too, both at a twinkling, I do liken straight her beautified body to a goodly temple that's built on vaults where carcasses lie rotting. And so, little by little, I shrink back again, and quench desire with a cool meditation, and am as well, methinks. Now for a welcome able to draw men's envies upon man, a kiss that now will hang upon my lip as sweet as morning dew upon a rose and full as long. After a five days' fast, she'll be so greedy now and cling about me, I take care how I shall be rid of her. And here it begins! Enter Bianca and mother. Oh, sir, you're welcome home. Oh, is he come? I am glad, aunt. Aside. Is that all? Why, this is dreadful now a sudden death to some rich man that flatters all his sins with promise of repentance when he's old and dies in the midway before he comes to it. Sure, you're not well, Bianca? How dost privy? I have been better than I am at this time. Alas, I thought so. Nay, I have been worse, too, than now you see me, sir. I'm glad thou minced yet. I feel my heart mend, too. How came it to thee? Has anything disliked thee in my absence? No, certain. I have had the best content that Florence can afford. Thou makest the best, aunt. Speak, mother, what's the cause? You must needs know. Troth I know none, son. Let her speak herself. Unless it be the same gave Lucifer a tumbling cast. That's pride. Methinks this house stands nothing to my mind. I'd have some pleasant lodging i' the high street, sir, or if t'were near the court, sir, that were much better. Tis a sweet recreation for a gentlewoman to stand in a bay window and see gallants. Now I have another temper, a mere stranger to that of yours, it seems. I should delight to see none but yourself. I praise not that. Too fond is as unseemly as too churlish. I would not have a husband of that proneness to kiss me before company for a world. Beside, tis tedious to see one thing still, sir, be it the best that ever heart affected. Nay, were it yourself, whose love had power, you know, to bring me from my friends, I would not stand thus and gaze upon you always. Truth I could not, sir, as could be blind and have no use of sight as look on one thing still. What's the eye's treasure but change of objects? You are learned, sir, and know I speak not ill. Tis full as virtuous for woman's eye to look on several men, as for her heart, sir, to be fixed on one. Now thou comest home to me. A kiss for that word. 
No matter for a kiss, sir, let it pass. Tis but a toy. We'll not so much as mind it. Let's talk of other business and forget it. What news now of the pirates? Any stirring? Prithee, discourse a little. Aside. I am glad he's here yet to see her tricked himself. I had lied monstrously if I had told him first. Speak. What's the humour, sweet, you make your lips so strange? This was not wont. Is there no kindness betwixt man and wife, unless they make a pigeon-house of friendship and be still billing? Tis the idlest fondness that ever was invented. And tis pity it's grown a fashion for poor gentle women. There's many a disease kissed in a year by it, and a French curtsy made to it. Alas, sir, think of the world. How shall we live, grow serious? We have been married a whole fortnight now. How, a whole fortnight? Why, is that so long? Tis time to leave off dalliance. Tis a doctrine of your own teaching, if you be remembered, and I was bound to obey it. Aside. Here's one fits him. This was well catched i' faith, son, like a fellow that reads another country of a plague and brings it home with him to his own house. Knocking within. Who knocks? Who's there now? Withdraw you, Bianca. Thou art a gem no strangers I must see, howe'er thou please now to look dull on me. Exit Bianca. Enter messenger. You're welcome, sir. To whom your business, pray? To one I see not here now. Who should that be, sir? A young gentlewoman I was sent to. A young gentlewoman? Ay, sir, about sixteen. Why look you wildly, sir? At your strange error. You've mistook the house, sir. There's none such here, I assure you. I assure you, too, the man that sent me cannot be mistook. Why, who is it sent you, sir? The Duke. The Duke? Yes, he entreats her company at a banquet at Lady Livia's house. Troth, shall I tell you, sir, it is the most erroneous business that e'er your honest pains was abused with. I pray forgive me if I smile a little. I cannot choose a faith, sir, at an error so comical as this. I mean no harm, though. His grace has been most wondrous ill-informed. Pray, so return it, sir. What should her name be? That I shall tell you straight, too. Bianca Capella. How, sir? Bianca? What do you call the other? Capella. Sir, it seems you know no such, then. Who should this be? I never heard of the name. Then tis a sure mistake. What if you inquired in the next street, sir? I saw gallants there in the new houses that are built of late. Ten to one, there you find her. Nay, no matter. I will return the mistake and seek no further. Use your own will and pleasure, sir. You're welcome. Exit messenger. What shall I think of first? Come forth, Bianca. Thou art betrayed, I fear me. Enter Bianca. Betrayed? How, sir? The Duke knows thee. Knows me? How know you that, sir? He's got thy name. Aside. Ay, and my good name, too. That's worse of the twain. How comes this work about? How should the Duke know me? Can you guess, mother? Not I, with all my wits. Sure we kept house close. Kept close? Not all the locks in Italy can keep you women so. You have been gadding, and ventured out at twilight to the court green yonder and met the gallant bowlers coming home. Without your masks, too, both of you I'll be hanged else. Thou hast been seen, Bianca, by some stranger. Never excuse it. I'll not seek the way, sir. Do you think you've married me to mew me up not to be seen? What would you make of me? A good wife, nothing else. Why, so are some that are seen every day, else the devil take em. No more, then. I believe all virtuous in thee without an argument. "'Twas but thy hard chance to be seen somewhere. "'There lies all the mischief. "'But I have devised a riddance. "'Now I can tell you, son, the time and place. "'When? Where?' "'What wits I have! "'When you last took your leave, if you remember, "'you left us both at window. "'Right, I know that. "'And not the third part of an hour after the Duke passed by, "'in a great solemnity, to St. Mark's Temple, "'and to my apprehension, he looked up twice to the window. Oh, there quickened the mischief of this hour. Aside. If you call it mischief, it is a thing I fear I am conceived with. Looked he up twice, and could you take no warning? Why, once may do as much harm, son, as a thousand. Do not you know one spark has fired in house, as well as a whole furnace? My heart flames for it. Yet let's be wise, and keep all smothered closely. I have before... A means. Is the door fast? I locked it myself after him. 
You know, mother, at the end of the dark parlour there's a place so artificially contrived for a conveyance no search could ever find it. When my father kept in for manslaughter, it was his sanctuary. There will I lock my life's best treasure up. By anchor! Would you keep me closer yet? Have you the conscience? Your bestine choke me up, sir. You make me fearful of your health and wits. You cleave to such wild courses. What's the matter? Why, are you so insensible of your danger to ask that now? The Duke himself has sent for you to Lady Livia's to a banquet for sooth. Now I beshrew you heartily, has he so? And you, the man who would never yet vouchsafe to tell me aunt till now. You show your loyalty and honesty at once, and so farewell, sir. By anchor? Whither now? Why, to the Duke, sir. You say he sent for me. But thou dost not mean to go, I hope. No, I shall prove unmannerly. Rude, uncivil, mad, and imitate you. Come, mother, come, follow his humour no longer. We shall all be executed for treason shortly. Not I, faith. I'll first obey the duke, and taste of a good banquet. I'm of thy mind. I'll step but up, and fetch two handkerchiefs, to pocket up some sweetmeats, and overtake thee. Exit. Aside. Why, here's an old wench would trot into a bod now for some dry sucket, or a colt in march pain. Exit. O oh, thou, the ripe time of man's misery, wedlock, with all his thoughts like overladen trees, crack with the fruits they bear in cares and jealousies. Oh, that's a fruit that ripens hastily after tis knit to marriage. It begins as soon as the sun shines upon the bride a little to show colour. Blessed powers, whence comes this alteration? The distractions, the fears and doubts it brings are numberless, and yet the cause I know not. What a peace has he that never marries! If he knew the benefits it enjoyed, or had the fortune to come and speak with me, he should know then the infinite wealth he had, and discern rightly the greatness of his treasure by my loss. Nay, what a quietness has he above mine that wears his youth out in a strumpet's arms, and never spends more care upon a woman than at the time of lust, but walks away, and if he find her dead at his return, his pity soon is done, he breaks a sigh in many parts, and gives her but a peace on't. But all the fears, shames, jealousies, costs and troubles, and still renewed cares of a marriage bed, live in the issue when the wife is dead. Enter Messenger a good perfection to your thoughts the news sir though you were pleased of late to pin an error on me you must not shift another in your stead too the duke has sent me for you how for me sir aside i see then tis my theft we're both betrayed well i'm not the first to stolen away a maid my countrymen have used it i'll along with you sir Accent. Scene two. Livia's house. A banquet prepared. Enter Guardiano and Ward. Take you a special note of such a gentlewoman. She's here on purpose. I have invited her, her father, and her uncle to this banquet. Mark her behaviour well. It does concern you. And what her good parts are, as far as time and place can modestly require a knowledge of, shall be laid open to your understanding. You know I'm both your guardian and your uncle. My care of you is double, ward and nephew, and I'll express it here. Faith, I should know her now by her mark among a thousand women. A little pretty deft and tidy thing you say? Right. With a lusty sprouting sprig in her hair? Thou goest the right way still. Take one mark more. Thou shalt ne'er find her hand out of her uncle's, or else his out of hers, if she be near him. The love of kindred never yet stuck closer than theirs to one another. He that weds her marries her uncle's heart too. Cornets. Say you so, sir? Then I'll be asked to the church to both of them. Fall back. Here comes the duke. He brings a gentlewoman. I should fall forward, rather. Enter Duke, leading in Bianca, and followed by Fabrizio, Hippolito, Livia, Mother, Isabella, and attendants. Come, Bianca, her purpose sent into the world to show perfection once in woman. 
I'll believe, henceforward, they have every one a soul, too, against all the uncourteous opinions that man's uncivil rudeness ever held of them. Glory of Florence, light into mine arms. Enter Leontio. Yon comes a grudging man will chide you, sir. The storm is now in's heart, and would get nearer and fall here if it durst. It pours down yonder. If that be he, the weather shall soon clear. List, and I'll tell thee how. Whispers. Aside. A kissing, too. I see tis plain lust now, adultery boldened. What will it prove anon when tis stuffed full of wine and sweetments, being so impudent fasting? To Leontio. We have heard of your good parts, sir, which we honour with our embrace and love. To gentlemen. Is not the captainship of Orleans citadel, since the late deceased, supplied by any yet? By none, my lord. To Leontio. Take it, the place is yours, then, and as faithfulness and desert grows, our favour shall grow with it. Rise now, the captain of our fort at Orleans. The service of whole life give your grace thanks. Come sit, Bianca. All sit down to the banquet. Aside. This is some good yet, and more than e'er I looked for. A fine bit to stay a cuckold's stomach. All preferment that springs from sin and lust, it shoots up quickly as gardeners' crops do in the rottenest grounds. So is all means raised from base prostitution, even like a salad growing upon a dunghill. I'm like a thing that was never yet heard of, half merry and half mad, much like a fellow that eats his meat with a good appetite and wears a plague sore that would fright a country, or rather, like the barren hardened ass that feeds on thistles till he bleeds again. And such is the condition of my misery. Is that your son, widow? Yes. Did your ladyship never know that till now? No. Trust me, did I? Aside, nor ever truly felt the power of love, and pity to a man till now I know him. I have enough to buy me my desires, and yet to spare. That's one good comfort. To Leontio. Hark you, pray let me speak with you, sir, before you go. With me, lady? You shall. I am at your service. What will she say, Tro? More goodness yet? I see her now, I'm sure. The ape's so little, I shall scarce feel her. I have seen almost as tall as she is sold in the fair for tenpence. See how she simpers it, as if marmalade would not melt her in her mouth. She might have the kindness, of faith, to send me a gilded bull from her own trencher, a ram, a goat, or somewhat to be nibbling. These women, when they come to sweet things once, they forget all their friends. They grow so greedy. Nay, oftentimes their husbands. Here's a health now, gallants, to the best beauty at this day in Florence. Whoe'er she be, she shall not go unpledged, sir. Nay, you're excused for this. Who? I, my lord. Yes, by the law of Bacchus. Plead your benefit. You're not bound to pledge your own health, lady. That's a good way, my lord, to keep me dry. Nay, that I will not offend Venus so much. Let Bacchus seek his men's in another court. Here's to thyself, Bianca. Nothing comes more welcome to that name than your grace. Aside. So, so, here stands the poor thief now that stole the treasure, and he's not fought on. Ours is near kin now to a twin misery born into the world. First the hard-conscienced worldling, he hoards wealth up. Then comes the next, and he feasts all upon. One's damned for getting, the other for spending on't. Oh, equal justice! Thou hast met my sin with a full weight. I'm rightly now oppressed. All her friends' heavy hearts lie in my breast. Methinks there is no spirit amongst us gallants, but what divinely sparkles from the eyes of bright Bianca. We sat all in darkness, but for that splendour. Who was told us lately of a matchmaking rite, a marriage tender? Twas I, my lord. Twas you indeed. Where is she? This is the gentlewoman. My lord, my daughter. Why, here's some stirring yet. She's a dear child to me. 
That must needs be. You say she is your daughter. Nay, my good lord, dear to my purse, I mean, beside my person. I ne'er reckoned that. She has the full qualities of a gentlewoman. I have brought her up to music, dancing, what not, that may commend her sex and stir her husband. And which is he now? This young heir, my lord. What is he brought up to? Aside. To cat and trap. My lord, he's a great ward, wealthy but simple. His parts consist in acres. Oh, wise acres. You've spoke him in a word, sir. Alas, poor gentlewoman, she's ill-bested, unless she's dealt the wiselier, and laid in more provision for her youth. Fools will not keep in summer. Aside. No, nor such wives from whores in winter. Yea, the voice too, sir. Ay, and a sweet breast too, my lord, I hope, or I have cast away my money wisely. She took her prick-song earlier, my lord, than any of her kindred ever did. A rare child, though I say it. But I'd not have the baggage here so much. T'would make her swell straight. And maids, of all things, must not be puffed up. Let's turn us to a better banquet, then. For music bids the soul of a man to a feast, and that's indeed a noble entertainment, worthy Bianca's self. You shall perceive, beauty, our Florentine damsels are not brought up idly. They are wiser of themselves, it seems, my lord, and can take gifts when goodness offers them. Music. Aside. True, and damnation has taught you that wisdom. You can take gifts, too. Oh, that music mocks me. Aside. I am as dumb to any language now but love's as one that never learned to speak. I am not yet so old, but he may think of me. My own fault, I have been idle a long time. But I'll begin the week and paint to-morrow. So follow my true labour day by day. I never thrived so well as when I used it. Isabella sings. What harder chance can fall to woman who was born to cleave to some man than to bestow her time youth beauty life's observance on a duty on a thing for no use good but to make physic work or blood force fresh in an old lady's cheek she that would be mother of fools let her compound with me Aside. Here's a tune indeed. Pish! I'd rather hear one ballad sung in the nose now of the lamentable drowning of fat sheep and oxen than all these simpering tunes played upon cats' guts and sung by little kitlings. How like you her breast now, my lord? Aside. Her breast? He talks as if his daughter had given suck before she were married, as her betters have. The next he prays is sure will be her nipples. Aside to Bianca. Methinks now such a voice to such a husband is like a jewel of unvalued worth hung at a fool's ear. May it please your grace to give her leave to show another quality. Marry as many good ones as you will, sir. The more the better welcome. Aside. But the less the better practised, that soul's black indeed that cannot commend virtue. But who keeps it? The extortioner will say to a sick beggar, Heaven comfort thee, though he give none himself. This good is common. Will it please you now, sir, to entreat your ward, to take her by the hand, and lead her in a dance before the duke? That will I, sir. Tis needful. Hark you, nephew. Whispers to him. Nay, you shall see, young heir, what you for your money, without fraud or imposture. Dance with her? Not I, sweet gardener. Do not urge my heart to it. Tis clean against my blood. Dance with a stranger. Let whose will do it. I'll not begin first with her. Aside. No, fear it not, fool. She has took a better order. Why, who shall take her, then? 
some other gentleman. Look, there's her uncle, a fine timbered reveller. Perhaps he knows the manner of her dancing, too. I'll have him do it before me. I have sworn God in her. Then may I learn the better. Thou'lt be an ass still. Aye, all that, uncle, shall not fool me out. Pish! I stick closer to myself than so. I must entreat you, sir, to take your niece and dance with her. My ward's a little wilful. He would have you show him the way. Me, sir? He shall command it at all hours. Pray tell him so. I thank you for him. He has not wit himself, sir. Come, my life's peace. Aside. I've a strange office on't here. Tis some men's luck to keep the joys he likes concealed for his own bosom, but my fortune to set him out now for another liking, like the mad misery of necessitous man that parts from his good horse with many praises and goes on foot himself. Need must be obeyed in every action. It mars man and maid. Music. Hippolito and Isabella dance, he bowing and she curtsying to the duke, and afterwards to each other, both before and after the dance. Signor Fabrizio, you're a happy father. Your cares and pains are fortunate, you see. Your cost bears noble fruits. Hippolito, thanks. Oh, here's some amends for all my charges yet. She wins both prick and praise where'er she comes. How likes Bianca? All things well, my lord, but this poor gentlewoman's fortune, that's the worst. There is no doubt, Bianca, she'll find leisure to make that good enough. He's rich and simple. She has the better hope of the upper hand indeed, which women strive for most. Do it when I bid you, sir. I'll venture but a hornpipe with her, gardener, or some such married man's dance. Well, venture something, sir. I have rhythm for what I do. But little reason, I think. Plain man dance the measures, the syncopis the gay. Cuckolds dance the hornpipe, and farmers dance the hay. Your soldiers dance the round, and maidens that grow big. Your drunkards the canaries, your whore and bawd the jig. Here's your eight kind of dancers. He that finds the ninth, let him pay the minstrels. Oh, here he appears once in his own person. I thought he would have married her by attorney, and lain with her so, too. Nay, my kind lord, there's very seldom any found so foolish to give away his part there. Aside. Bitter scoff, yet I must do it. With what a cruel pride the glory of her sin strikes by my afflictions. Ward and Isabella dance. He ridiculously imitates Hippolito. This thing will make shift, sirs, to make a husband, for aught I see in him. How thinks Bianca? Faith, an ill-favoured shift, my lord, methinks. If he would take some voyage when he's married, dangerous or long enough, and scarce be seen once in nine year together, a wife then might make indifferent shift to be content with him. A kiss. That wit deserves to be made much on. Come, Alcarosh. Stands ready for your grace. My thanks to all your loves. Come, fair Bianca, we have took special care of you, and provided your lodging near us now. Your love is great, my lord. Once more, our thanks to all. All blessed are you. Exeunt all but Leontio and Livia. Cornets flourish. Leontio, without noticing Livia. Hast thou left me then, Bianca, utterly? Oh, Bianca, now I miss thee. I'll oh, return and save the faith of woman. I ne'er felt the loss of thee till now. Tis an affliction of greater weight than youth was made to bear, as if a punishment of after life were fallen upon man here. So new it is to flesh and blood, so strange, so insupportable. A torment e'en mistook as if a body whose death were drowning must needs therefore suffer it in scalding oil. Sweet sir. As long as mine eye saw thee, I half enjoyed thee. Sir. Canst thou forget the dear pains my love took? How it has watched whole nights together in all weathers for thee? 
yet stood in heart more merry than the tempest that sung about mine ears like dangerous flatterers that can set all their mischief to sweet tunes and then receive thee from thy father's window into these arms at midnight when we embraced as if we'd been statues only made for it to show art's life so silent were our comforts and kissed as if our lips had grown together oh, this makes me madder to enjoy him now canst thou forget all this and better joys than we met after this which then new kisses took pride to praise i shall grow madder yet sir this cannot be but of some close boards working cry mercy lady w what would you say to me my sorrow makes me so unmannerly so comfort bless me i quite forgot you nothing but e'en in pity to that passion would give your grief good counsel marry and welcome lady it never could come better then first sir to make away all your good thoughts at once of her no most assuredly she is a strumpet ha huh. most assuredly speak not of things so vile so certainly leave it more doubtful then i must leave all truth and spare my knowledge a sin which i too lately found and wept for found you it ay with wet eyes Oh, perjurous friendship! You missed your fortunes when you met with her, sir? Young gentlemen that only love for beauty, they love not wisely. Such a marriage rather proves the destruction of affection. It brings on want, and wants the key of whoredom. I think you'd small means with her. Oh, not any lady. Alas! Poor gentleman! What mean'st thou, sir, quite to undo thyself with thine own kind heart? Thou art too good and pitiful to woman. Marry, sir, thank thy stars for this blest fortune that rids the summer of thy youth so well from many beggars, that had lain a sunning in thy beams only else, till thou hadst wasted the whole days of thy life in heat and labour. What would you say now to a creature found as pitiful to you, and as it were e'en sent on purpose from the whole sex general, to requite all that kindness you have shown to it? What's that, madam? Nay, a gentlewoman, and one able to reward good things. Ay, and bears a conscience to it. Couldst thou love such a one? that blow all fortunes would never see thee want nay more maintain thee to thine enemy's envy and shalt not spend a care for't stir a thought nor break a sleep unless love's music waked thee no storm of fortune should look upon me and know that woman Oh, my life's wealth by anchor! Still with her name, will nothing wear it out? That deep sigh went but for a strumpet, sir. It can go for no other that loves me. Aside, oh, he's vexed in mind. I came too soon to him. Where's my discretion now, my skill, my judgment? I'm cunning in all arts but my own. Love. "'Tis as unseasonable to attempt him now so soon "'as for a widow to be courted following her husband's course, "'or to make bargain by the graveside and take a young man there. "'Her strange departure stands like a hearse yet before his eyes, "'which time will take down shortly. Exit. "'Is she my wife till death, yet no more mine? "'That's a hard measure. "'Then what's marriage good for? "'Methinks by right I should not now be living, "'and then to all well.' What a happiness had I been made of had I never seen her, for nothing makes man's loss grievous to him but knowledge of the worth of what he loses. For what he never had, he never misses. She's gone for ever, utterly. There is as much redemption of a soul from hell as a fair woman's body from his palace. Why should my love last longer than her truth? What is there good in woman to be loved when only that which makes her so has left her? I cannot love her now, but I must like her sin, and my own shame too, and be guilty of law's breach with her, and mine own abusing, all which were monstrous. Then my safest course, for health of mind and body, is to turn my heart, and hate her, 
most extremely hate her. I have no other way. These virtuous powers which were chaste witnesses of both our troths can witness she breaks first, and I'm rewarded with captainship of the fort. A place of credit, I must confess, but poor. My factorship shall not exchange means with it. He that died last in it, he was no drunkard, yet he died a beggar for all his thrift. Besides, the place not fits me. It suits my resolution, not my breeding. Re-enter Livia. Aside. I have tried all ways I can, and have not power to keep from sight of him. How are you now, sir? I feel a better ease, madam. Oh, thanks to blessedness! You will do well, I warrant you. Fear it not, sir. Join but your own good will to it. He's not wise that loves his pain or sickness, or grows fond of a disease whose property is to vex him, and spitefully drink his blood up. Out upon, sir! Youth knows no greater loss. I pray, let's walk, sir. You never saw the beauty of my house yet, nor how abundantly fortune has blessed me in world treasure. Trust me, I have enough, sir, to make my friend a rich man in my life, a great man at my death. Yourself will say so. If you want anything and spare to speak, troth I'll condemn you for a willful man, sir. Why, sure this can be but the flattery of some dream. Now by this kiss, my love, my soul, and riches, tis all true substance. Kisses him. <sighs> Come, you shall see my wealth. Take what you list. The gallanter you go, the more you please me. I will allow you to your page and footman, your race-horses, or any various pleasure exercised youth delights in. But to me— only, sir, wear your heart of constant stuff. Do you but love enough, I'll give enough. Troth, then, I'll love enough, and take enough. Then we are both pleased enough. Exeunt. Scene three. Enter Guardiano and Isabella at one door, and the ward and Sordido at another. Now, nephew, here's the gentlewoman again. Mass, here she comes again. Mark her now, Sodido. This is the maid my love and care has chosen out for your wife, and so I tender her to you. Yourself has been eye-witness of some qualities that speak a courtly breeding and are costly. I bring you both to talk together now. Tis time you grew familiar in your tongues. Tomorrow you join hands, and one ring ties you, and one bed holds you. If you like the choice, her father and her friends are in the next room, and stay to see the contract ere they part. Therefore dispatch, good ward, be sweet and short. Like her or like her not, there's but two ways, and one your body, t'other your purse pays. I warrant you, gardener, I'll not stand all day thrumming, but quickly shoot my bolt at your next coming. Well said. Good fortune to your birding, then. I never missed Mark yet. Troth, I think, master, if the truth were known, you never shot at any but the kitchen wench, and that was a she-wood cock, a mere innocent, that was oft lost and cried at eight and twenty. No more of that meat, Sordido. Here's eggs of the spit now. We must turn gingerly, draw out the catalogue of all the faults of women. How <laughs> all the faults? Have you so little reason to think so much paper will lie in my breeches? Why, tin carts will not carry it if you set down but the boards. All the faults. Pray, let's be content with a few of them. And if they were less, you would find them enough, I warrant you. Look you, sir. Aside. But that I have the advantage of the fool, as much as a woman's heart can wish and joy at, what an infernal torment were to be thus bought and sold, and turned and pried into, when, alas, the worst bit is too good for him. The comfort is has but a caitus place on't, and provides all for another's table. Yet how curious the ass is, like some nice professor on't, that buys up all the daintiest foods in the markets, and seldom licks his lips after a taste on it. Now to her, now you've scanned all her p 
parts over. But at which end shall I begin now, Sordido? Oh, ever at a woman's lip, while you live, sir. Do you ask that question? Methinks, Sordido, she's but a crabbed face to begin with. A crabbed face? That will save money. How? Save money, Sordido? Aye, sir. For having a crabbed face of her own, she'll eat the less verjuice with her mutton. Twill save verjuice at the year's end, sir. Nay, and your jests begin to be saucy once. I'll make you eat your meat without mustard. And that in some kind is a punishment. Gentlewoman, they say tis your pleasure to be my wife, and you shall know shortly whether it be mine or no to be your husband. And thereupon thus I first enter upon you. Kisses her. Oh, most delicious scent. Methinks it tasted as if a man had stepped into a comfort maker's shop to let a cart go by, all the while I kissed her. It is reported, gentlewoman, you'll run mad for me if you have me not. I should be in great danger of my wit, sir, for being so forward. Aside. Should this ass kick backward now? Alas, poor soul, and is that hair your own? Mine own? Yes, sure, sir, I owe nothing for it. "'Tis a good hearing. I shall have less to pay when I have married you. "'To Sordido. "'Look, do her eyes stand well?' "'They cannot stand better than in her head, I think. Where would you have them? "'And for her nose, tis of a very good last.' "'I have known as good as that has not lasted a year, though.' "'Last in the using of a thing. Will not any strong bridge fall down in time if we do nothing but be at the bottom?' A nose above would not last always, sir, especially if it came in the camp once. But, Sordido, how shall we do to make her laugh that I may see what teeth she has? For I'll not bait her tooth, nor take a black one into the bargain. Why, do you but fool and talk with her? You cannot choose but one time or other to make her laugh, sir. It shall go hard, but I will. To Isabella. Pray, what qualities have you besides singing and dancing? Can you play at the shittlecock, forsooth? Ay, and at the stool-ball too, sir. I have great luck at it. Why, can you catch a ball well? I have catched two in my lap at one game. What, have you, woman? I must have you learn to play at trap too. Then you're full and whole. Anything that you please to bring me up to, I shall take pains to practice. Twill not do, Sordido. We shall never get her mouth open wide enough. No, sir? Oh, that's strange. Then here's a trick for your learning. Sordido gapes. Isabella gapes also, but covers her mouth with a handkerchief. Look now! Look now! Quick! Quick there! Pox of that scurvy mannerly trick with handkerchief. It hindered me a little, but I am satisfied. When a fair woman grapes and stops her mouth so, it shows like a cloth stopple in a cream pot. I have fair hope of her teeth now, Sordido. Why, then you've all well, sir, for all I see. She's right and straight enough now as she stands. They'll commonly lie crooked, that's no matter. Wise gamesters never find fault with that. Let them lie still so. I'd fain mark how she goes, and then I have all. For of all creatures I cannot abide a splay-footed woman. She's an unlucky thing to meet in the morning. Her heels keep together so as if she were beginning an Irish dance still, and the wriggling of her bum playing the tune to it. But I have bethought a cleanly ship to find it, dab down as you see me, and peep of one side when her back toward you. I'll show you this way. And you shall find me apt enough to peeping. I've been of them as seen mad sights under your scaffold. With please you walk, forsooth, a turn or two by yourself. You are so pleasing to me, I take delight to view you on both sides. I shall be glad to fetch a walk to your love, sir. T'will get affection a good stomach, sir. Aside which I had need have to fall to such coarse victuals. She walks to the end of the stage, and they stoop down to look at her. Now go thy ways for a clean treading wench, as ever man in modesty peeped under. I see the sweetest sight to please my master. Never went Frenchman righter upon ropes than she on Florentine rushes. Tis enough, forsooth. And how do you like me now, sir? Faith so well. I never mean to part with thee, sweetheart under some sixteen children and all boys. You'll be at simple pains, if you prove kind, and breed em all in your teeth. Nay, by my faith, what serves your belly for? Twould make my cheeks look like blown bagpipes. Enter Guardiano. How now, ward and nephew? 
gentlewoman and niece speak is it so or not tis so we are both agreed sir in to your kindred then there's friends and wine and music waits to welcome you oh, then i'll be drunk for joy and i for company i cannot break my nose in a better action Axiant. end of act three Act Four, Scene One. Bianca's lodgings at court. Enter Bianca attended by two ladies. How go your watches, ladies? What's o'clock now? Be mine, full nine. By mine, a quarter past. I set mine by Saint Mark's. Saint Anthony's, they say, goes truer. That's but your opinion, madam, because your love and gentleman all the name. He's a true gentleman then. So may he be, that comes to me to-night, for all to know. I'll end this strife straight. I set mine by the sun. I love to set by the best. One shall not then be troubled to set often. You do wisely, int. If I should set my watch as some girls do by every clock i' the town, t'would ne'er go true, and too much turning of the dial's point or tampering with the spring might in small time spoil the whole work too. Here it wants of nine now. It does indeed, forsooth. Mine's nearest truth yet. Yet I have found her lying with an advocate, which showed like two false clocks together in one parish. So now I thank you, ladies. I desire a while to be alone. And I am nobody, methinks, unless I have one or other in me. Aside. Faith my desires. And hers will never be, sisters. Exit, ladies. How strangely woman's fortune comes about! This was the farthest way to come to me. All would have judged that knew me born in Venice, and there with many jealous eyes brought up, that never thought they had me sure enough but when they were upon me. Yet my haps to meet it here, so far off from my birthplace, my friends or kindred, "'Tis not good in sadness to keep a maid so strict in her young days. "'Restraint breeds wandering thoughts, "'as many fasting days a great desire to see flesh stirring again. "'I'll ne'er use any girl of mine so strictly. "'Howe'er they're kept, their fortunes find em out. "'I see it in me. "'If they be got in court, I'll never forbid em the country, "'nor the court, though they be born i' the country.' They will come to it and fetch their falls a thousand mile about, where one would little think on't. Enter Leontio. I long to see how my despiser looks now she's come to court. These are her lodgings. She's simply now advanced. I took her out of no such window I remember first. That was a great deal lower and less carved. How now? What silkworm's this? In the name of pride, what, is it he? A bow in the ham to your greatness. You must have now free legs, I take it, must you not? Then I must take another. I shall want else the service I should have. You have but two there. You're richly placed. Methinks you're wondrous brave, sir. A sumptuous lodging. You've an excellent suit there. A chair of velvet. Is your cloak lined through, sir? You're very stately here. Faith, something proud, sir. Stay, stay. Let's see your cloth of silver slippers. Who's your shoemaker? He's made you a neat boot. Will you have a pair? Yes, when I ride. Tis a brave life you lead. I could ne'er see you in such good clothes in my time. In your time? Sure, I think, sir. We both thrive best asunder. You're a whore! Fear nothing, sir. An impudent, spiteful strumpet! Oh, sir, you give me thanks for your captainship. I thought you had forgot all your good manners. Gives her a paper. And to spite me as much, look there, there, read, vex, nor thou shalt find there, I am not love-starved. The world was never yet so cold or pitiless, but there was ever still more charity found out than at one proud fool's door, and twere hard if faith if I could not pass that. Read to thy shame there, a cheerful and a beauteous benefactor too, as e'er erected the good works of love. Aside. Lady Livia, is't possible? Her worship was my pandress. She dote and send and give and all to him. Why, here's a bawd-plagued home. You're simply happy, sir, yet I'll not envy you. 
No, court saint, not thou. You keep some friend of a new fashion. There's no harm in your devil. He's a suckling, but he will breed death shortly, will he not? Take heed you play not then too long with him. Yes, and the great one, too. I shall find time to play a hot religious bout with some of you, and perhaps drive you and your course of sins to their eternal kennels. I speak softly now. Tis manners in a noble woman's lodgings, and I well know all my degrees of duty. But come I to your everlasting parting once. Thunder shall seem soft music to that tempest. Twas said last week there would be change of weather when the moon hung so, and belike you heard it. Why, here's sin made, and ne'er a conscience put to it, a monster with all forehead and no eyes. Why do I talk to thee of sense or virtue that art as dark as death, and as much madness to set light before thee as to lead blind folks to see the monuments which they may smell as soon as they behold? Marry, oft times their heads, for want of light, may feel the hardness of them. So shall thy blind pride my revenge and anger. Thou canst not see it now, and it may fall at such an hour when thou least seest of all. So to an ignorance darker than thy womb I leave thy perjured soul. A plague will come. Exit. Get you gone first, and then I fear no greater. Nor thee will I fear long. I'll have this sauciness soon banished from these lodgings and the rooms perfumed well after the corrupt air it leaves. His breath has made me almost sick in troth, a poor base start-up. Life, because has got fair clothes by foul means, comes to rail and show em. Enter the Duke. Who's that? Cry you mercy, sir. Prithee, who's that? The former thing, my lord, to whom you gave the captainship. He eats his meat with grudging still. Still? He comes vaunting here of his new love and the new clothes she gave him, Lady Livia, who but she now his mistress. Lady Livia, be sure of what you say. He showed me her name, sir, in perfumed paper, her vows, her letter, with an intent to spite me. So his heart said, and his threats made it good. They were as spiteful as ever malice uttered, and as dangerous, should his hand follow the copy. But that must not. Do not you vex your mind. Prithee to bed, go. All shall be well and quiet. I love peace, sir. Exit. And so do all that love. Take you no care for it. It shall be still provided to your hand. Who's near us there? Enter messenger. My lord. Seek out Hippolito, brother to Lady Livia, with all speed. He was the last man I saw, my lord. Exit. Make haste. He is a blood soon stirred, and as he's quick to apprehend a wrong, he's bold and sudden in bringing forth a ruin. I know likewise the reputation of his sister's honours, as dear to him as life-blood to his heart. Beside, I'll flatter him with a goodness to her, which I now thought on, but ne'er meant to practice, because I know her base, and that wind drives him. The ulcerous reputation feels the poise of lightest wrongs, as sores are vexed with flies. He comes. Hippolyto, welcome. Enter Hippolyto. My love, lord. How does that lusty widow, thy kind sister? Is she not sped yet of a second husband? A bedfellow she has, I ask not that. I know she's sped of him. Of him, my lord? Yes, of a bedfellow. Is the news so strange to you? I hope tis so to all. I wish it were, sir, but tis confessed too fast. Her ignorant pleasures, only by lust instructed, have received into their services an impudent boaster, one that does raise his glory from her shame, and tells the midday sun what's done in darkness. Yet, blinded with her appetite, wastes her wealth, buys her disgraces at a dearer rate than bounteous housekeepers purchase their honour. Nothing sads me so much as that in love to thee and to thy blood I had picked out a worthy match for her, the great Vincentio, high in our favour and in all men's thoughts. Oh, thou destruction of all happy fortunes, unsated blood! Know you the name, my lord, of her abuser? 
One Leancio. He's a factor. He ne'er made so brave a voyage by his own talk. The poor old widow, son. I humbly take my leave. Aside. I see it is done. Give her good counsel, make her see her error. I know she'll hearken to you. Yes, my lord. I make no doubt I shall take the course which she shall never know till it be acted, and when she wakes to honour, then she'll thank me for it. I'll imitate the pities of old surgeons to this lost limb, who ere they show their art cast one asleep, then cut the diseased part. So out of love to her I pity most, she shall not feel the going till he's lost. Then she'll commend the cure. Exit. Ha, ha, ha. Thy great cure's past. I count this done already. His wrath's sure, and speaks an injury deep. Farewell, Leancio. This place will never hear thee murmur more. Enter Lord Cardinal, attended. Our noble brother, welcome. Set those lights down. Depart till you be called. Exit attendants. Aside. The serious business fixed in his look. Nay, it inclines a little to the dark colour of a discontentment. Brother, what is commands your eye so powerfully? Speak. You seem lost. The thing I look on seems so to my eyes, lost for ever. You look on me. What a grief tis to a religious feeling, to think a man should have a friend so goodly, so wise, so noble, nay, a duke, a brother, and all this certainly damned. How? "'Tis no wonder if your great sin can do it. Dare you look up for thinking of a vengeance? Dare you sleep for fear of never waking but to death? And dedicate unto a strumpet's love the strength of your affection, zeal, and health? Here you stand now. Can you assure your pleasures you shall once more enjoy her? But once more? Alas, you cannot. What a misery tis then to be more certain of eternal death than of a next embrace! Nay, shall I show you how more unfortunate you stand in sin than the low private man? All his offences, like enclosed grounds, keep but about himself, and seldom stretch beyond his own soul's bounds. And when a man grows miserable, tis some comfort when he's no further charged than with himself. Tis a sweet ease to wretchedness. Oh, but great man, every sin thou committest shows like a flame upon a mountain, tis seen far about, and with a big wind made of popular breath, the sparkles fly through cities. Here one takes, another catches there, and in short time waste all to cinders. But remember still, what burnt the valleys first came from the hill. Every offence draws his particular pain, but his example proves the great man's bane. The sins of mean men lie like scattered parcels of an unperfect bill. But when such fall, then comes example, and that sums up all. And this your reason grants, if men of good lives, who by their virtuous actions stir up others to noble and religious imitation, receive the greater glory after death, as sin must needs confess. What may they feel in height of torments and in weight of vengeance? Not only they themselves not doing well, but set a light up to show men to hell. If you have done, I have. No more, sweet brother. I know time spent in goodness is too tedious. This had not been a moment's space in lust now. How dare you venture on eternal pain that cannot bear a minute's reprehension? Methinks you should endure to hear that talked of which you so strive to suffer. Oh, my brother, what were you if you were taken now? 
my heart weeps blood to think on it tis a work of infinite mercy you can never merit that yet you were not death-struck no not yet i dare not stay you long for fear you should not have time enough allowed you to repent in there's but this wall pointing to his body betwixt you and destruction when you are at your strongest and but poor thin clay think upon it brother can you come so near it for a fair strumpet's love and fall into a torment that knows neither end nor bottom for beauty but the deepness of a skin and that not of their own either if she is a thing whom sickness dare not visit or age look on or death resist does the worm shun her grave if not as your soul knows it why should lust bring man to lusting pain for rotten dust brother of spotless honour let me weep the first of my repentance in thy bosom and show the blessed fruits of a thankful spirit and if i e'er keep woman more unlawfully may i want penitence at my greatest need and wise men know there is no barren place threatens more famine than a dearth in grace why here is a conversation is at this time brother sung in a hymn to heaven and at this instant the powers of darkness groan makes all hell sorry first i praise heaven then in my work i glory who's there attends without enter servants take up those lights there was a thicker darkness when they came first the peace of a fair soul keep with you my noble brother exit cardinal etc joys be with you sir she lies alone to-night for it and must still though it be hard to conquer but i have vowed never to know her as a strumpet more and i must save my oath if fury fail not her husband dies to-night or at the most lives not to see the morning spent to-morrow then will i make her lawfully mine own without this sin and horror now i'm chidden for what i shall enjoy then unforbidden and i'll not freeze in stoves tis but a while live like a hopeful bridegroom chased from flesh and pleasure then will seem new fair and fresh exit scene two enter hippolyto the morning so far wasted yet his baseness so impudent see if the very sun do not blush at him dare he do thus much and know me alive put case one must be vicious as i know myself monstrously guilty there's a blind time made for it that he might use only that twere conscionable art silence closeness subtlety and darkness are fit for such a business but there's no pity to be bestowed on an apparent sinner an impudent daylight lecher the great zeal i bear to her advancement in this match with lord vicentio as the duke has wrought it to the perpetual honour of our house puts fire into my blood to purge the air of this corruption fear it spread too far and poison the whole hopes of this fair fortune i love her good so dearly that no brother shall venture further for a sister's glory than i for her preferment enter leontio and a page once again i'll see that glistering whore shines like a serpent now the court sun's upon her page anon sir i'll go in state too see the coach be ready i'll hurry away presently yes you shall hurry and the devil after you take that at setting forth strikes him now and you'll draw we're upon equal terms sir thou tookst advantage of my name in honour upon my sister i ne'er saw the stroke come till i found my reputation bleeding and therefore count it no sin to valour to serve thy lust so now we're of even hand take your blessed course against me you must die how close sticks envy to man's happiness when i was poor and little cared for life 
I had no such means offered me to die. No man's wrath minded me. Slave, I turn this to thee, to call thee to account for a wound lately of a base stamp upon me. Draws. Twas most fit for a base metal. Come and fetch one now, more noble then, for I will use thee fairer than thou hast done thine own soul and our honour. And there, I think, tis for thee. They fight. Leontio falls. False wife, I feel now thou'st prayed heartly for me. Rise, strumpet, by my fall. Thy lust may reign now. My heart-string and the marriage knot that tied thee break both together. There I heard the sound on't, and never liked string better. Enter Guardiano, Livia, Isabella, Ward, and Sordido. Tis my brother. Are you hurt, sir? Not anything. Blessed fortune. Shift for thyself. What is he thou hast killed? Our honour's enemy. Know you this man, lady? Leontio! My love's joy! To Hippolito. Wounds stick upon thee as deadly as thy sins. Art thou not hurt? The devil take that fortune, and he dead? Drop plagues into thy bowels without voice, secret and fearful. Run for officers. Let him be apprehended with all speed, for fear he scape away. Lay hands upon him. We cannot be too short, his willful murder. They seize Hippolito. You do heaven's vengeance and the Lord just service. You know him not as I do. He's a villain, as monstrous as a prodigy, and as dreadful. Will you but entertain a noble patience, till you but hear the reason, worthy sister? The reason? That's a jest hell falls a-laughing at. Is there a reason found for the destruction of our more lawful loves? And was there none to kill the black lust twixt thy niece and thee that has kept close so long? How's that, good madam? Too true, sir. There she stands. Let her deny it. The deed cries shortly in the midwife's arms, unless the parent's sin strike it stillborn. And if you be not deaf and ignorant, you'll hear strange notes ere long. Look on me, wench. T'was I betrayed thy honour subtly to him under a false tale. It lights upon me now. His arm has paid me home upon thy breast, my sweet beloved Leontio. Was my judgment and care in choice so devilishly abused, so beyond shamefully, all the world will grin at me. Oh, Sordido, Sordido, I'm damned, I'm damned. Damned? Why, sir? One of the wicked doth not seat a cuckold, a plain reprobate cuckold. Nay, and you be damned for that. Be of good cheer, sir. You've gallant company of all professions. I'll have a wife next Sunday, too, because I'll along with you myself. That will be some comfort yet. You, sir, that bear your load of injuries as I of sorrows, lend me your grieved strength to this sad burden. Pointing to the body of Leontio, who in life or actions flames were not nimbler. We will talk of things may have the luck to break our hearts together. I'll list to nothing but revenge and anger, whose counsels I will follow. Exeunt Livia and Guardiano with the body of Leontio. A wife, quoth her. Here's a sweet plum tree of your gardener's grafting. Nay, there's a worse name belongs to this fruit yet, and you could hit on't. A more open one, for he that marries a whore looks like a fellow bound all his lifetime to a meddler tree, and that's good stuff. Tis no sooner ripe, but it looks rotten, and so do some queens at nineteen. Pox on it! I thought there was some knavery abroach, for something stirred in her belly the first night I laid with her. What? What, sir? This is she brought up so courtly, can sing and dance and tumble too methinks i'll never marry wife again that has so many qualities and did they are oh, seldom good master for likely when they are taught so many they will have one trick more of their own finding out well give me a wench but with one good quality to lie with none but her husband and that springing up enough for any woman breathing this was a fault when she was tendered to me you never looked to this alas 
How would you have me see through a great farthing ale, sir? I cannot peep through a millstone, or in the going to see what's done in the bottom. Her father praised her breast, she'd the voice forsooth. I marvelled she sung so small indeed, being no maid. Now I perceive there's a young chorister in her belly. This breeds a singing in my head, I'm sure. Tis but the tune of your wife's syncopace danced in a feather-bed. Faith, go lie down, master, but take heed your horns do not make holes in the pillow-burrs. Aside. I would not batter brows with him for hogs out of angels. He would prick my skull as full of holes as a scrivener's sandbox. Exeunt ward and sordido. Aside. Was ever maid so cruelly beguiled to the confusion of life, soul, and honour, all of one woman's murdering? I'd fain bring her name no nearer to my blood than woman, and tis too much of that. Oh, shame and horror! In that small distance from yon man to me, lies sin enough to make a whole world perish. To Hippolito. Tis time we parted, sir, and left the sight of one another. Nothing can be worse to hurt repentance, for our very eyes are far more poisonous to religion than basilisks to them. If any goodness rest in you, hope of comforts, fear of judgments, my request is, I ne'er may see you more, and so I turn me from you everlastingly, so is my hope to miss you. But for her, that durst so dally with a sin so dangerous, and lay a snare so spitefully for my youth, if the least means but favour my revenge, that I may practise the like cruel cunning upon her life, as she has on mine honour, I'll act it without pity. Here's a care of reputation and a sister's fortune sweetly rewarded by her. Would a silence as great as that which keeps among the graves had everlastingly chained up her tongue? My love to her has made mine miserable. Enter Guardiano and Livia. If you can but dissemble your heart's griefs now, be but a woman so far. Peace! I'll strive, sir. As I can wear my injuries in a smile. Here's an occasion offered that gives anger both liberty and safety to perform things worth the fire it holds, without the fear of danger or of law. For mischiefs acted under the privilege of a marriage triumph at the Duke's hasty nuptials will be thought things merely accidental, all by chance, not got of their own natures. I conceive you, sir, even to a longing for performance on't and here behold some fruits. Kneels to Hippolyto and Isabella. Forgive me both. What I am now returned to sense and judgment, tis not the same rage and distraction presented lately to you. That rude form is gone for ever. I am now myself, that speaks all peace and friendship, and these tears are the true springs of hearty penitent sorrow for those foul wrongs which my forgetful fury slandered your virtues with. This gentleman is well resolved now. I was never otherwise. I knew, alas, twas but your anger spake it, and I ne'er thought on more. Pray, rise, good sister. Aside. Here's e'en as sweet amends made for a wrong now, as one that gives a wound and pays the surgeon. All the smarts nothing, the great loss of blood, or time of hindrance. Well, I had a mother, I can dissemble too. What wrongs have slipped through anger's ignorance, aunt, my heart forgives. Why, that's tuneful now. And what I did, sister, was all for honour's cause, which time to come will approve to you. Being awaked to goodness, I understand so much, sir, and praise now the fortune of your arm and of your safety. For by his death you've rid me of a sin as costly as e'er woman doted on. Tis pleased the Duke so well, too, that, behold, sir, has sent you here your pardon, which I kissed with most affectionate comfort. When t'was brought, then was my fit just past. It came so well, methought, to glad my heart. I see his grace thinks on me. There's no talk now but of the preparation for the great marriage. Does he marry her, then? with all speed, suddenly, as fast as cost can be laid on with many thousand hands. This gentleman and I had once a purpose to have honoured the first marriage of the Duke with an invention of his own, and was ready the pains well past, most of the charge bestowed on't, 
Then came the death of your good mother, niece, and turned the glory of it all to black. "'Tis a device would fit these times so well, too. Art's treasury not better. If you'll join, it shall be done. The cost shall be all mine." "'You've my voice first. Twill well approve my thankfulness for the Duke's love and favour." "'What say you, niece?" "'I am content to make one.' "'The plot's full, then. Your pages, madam, will make shift for cupids.' "'That will they, sir?' "'You'll play your old part still.' "'What is't? Good troth, I have even forgot it.' "'Why, Juno Pronuba, the marriage goddess.' "'Oh, tis right, indeed.' And you shall play the nymph that offers sacrifice to appease her wrath. Sacrifice, good sir. Must I be appeased, then? That's as you list yourself, as you see cause. Methinks twould show the more state in her deity to be incensed. Twould, but my sacrifice shall take a course to appease you. Aside. Or I'll fail in it, and teach a sinful bard to play a goddess. Exit. For our parts... We'll not be ambitious, sir. Please you walk in, and see the project drawn. Then take your choice. I weigh not, so I have one. Exeunt Guardiano and Hippolito. How much ado have I to restrain fury from breaking into curses! Oh, how painful tis to keep great sorrow smothered! Sure I think tis harder to dissemble grief than love. Leontio. Here the weight of thy loss lies, which nothing but destruction can suffice. Exit. Hote boys, the Duke and Bianca enter in great state, very richly attired, attended by lords, cardinals, ladies, and others. As they are passing solemnly over the stage, the Lord Cardinal enters in a rage, and interrupts the ceremony. Religious honours done to sin disparage virtue's reverence and will pull heaven's thunder upon Florence. Holy ceremonies were made for sacred uses, not for sinful. Are these the fruits of your repentance, brother? Better it had been you never sorrowed than to abuse the benefit and return to worse than where sin left you. Vowed you then never to keep strumpet more. And are you now so swift in your desires to knit your honour and your life fast to her? Is sin not sure enough to wretched man, but he must bind himself in chains to it? Worse, must marriage, that immaculate robe of honour that renders virtue glorious, fair, and fruitful to her great master, be now made the garment of leprosy and foulness. Is this penitence to sanctify hot lust? What is it otherwise than worship done to devils? Is this the best amends that sin can make after her riots? As if a drunkard, to appease heaven's wrath, should offer up his surfeit for a sacrifice. If that be comely, then lust offerings are on wedlock's sacred altar. Hear your bitter without cause, brother, what I vowed I'd keep, as safe as you your conscience. And this needs not. I taste more wrath in than I do religion, and envy more than goodness. The path now I tread is honest, leads to lawful love, which virtue in her strictness would not check. I vowed no more to keep a sensual woman. Tis done, I mean to make a lawful wife of her. He that taught you that craft, call him not master long. He will undo you. Grow not too cunning for your soul, dear brother. Is it not enough to use adulterous thefts, and then take sanctuary in marriage? I grant, so long as an offender keeps close in a privileged temple, his life safe. But if he ever venture to come out, and so be taken, then he surely dies for it. So now you're safe. But when you leave this body, 
man's only privileged temple upon earth in which the guilty soul takes sanctuary then you'll perceive what wrongs chaste vows endure when lust usurps the bed that should be pure sir i have read you over all this while in silence and i find great knowledge in you and severe learning yet mongst all your virtues i see not charity written which some call the first-born of religion, and I wonder I cannot see it in yours. Believe it, sir, there is no virtue can be sooner missed or later welcomed. It begins the rest and sets them all in order. Heaven and angels take great delight in a converted sinner. Why should you, then, a servant and professor, differ so much from them? If every woman that commits evil should be therefore kept back in desires of goodness, how should virtue be known and honoured? From a man that's blind to take a burning taper, tis no wrong, he never misses it. But to take light from one that sees, that's injury and spite. Pray whether is religion better served when lives that are licentious are made honest than when they still run through a sinful blood. Tis nothing virtue's temples to deface, but build the ruins, there's a work of grace. I kiss thee for that spirit. Thou hast praised thy wit a modest way. On, on there. Lust is bold, and will have vengeance speak, ere it be controlled. Axiant. End of Act Four. Act Five, Scene One. Enter Guardiano and Ward. Speak, hast thou any sense of thy abuse? Dost thou know what wrongs done thee? I were an ass else. I cannot wash my face, but I am feeling aught. Here, take this caltrop, then convey it secretly into the place I showed you. Look you, sir, this is the trap-door to it. I know it of old, uncle, since the last triumph, here rose up a devil with one eye. I remember with a company of fireworks at's tail. Prithee, leave squibbling now. Mark me, and fail not. But when thou hearest me give a stamp, down with it. The villain's caught, then. If I miss you, hang me. I love to catch a villain, and your stamp shall go current, I warrant you. But how shall I rise up and let him down, too, all at one hole? That will be a horrible puzzle. You know I have a part, and I play slander. True, but never make you ready for it. No, my clothes are bought and all and a foul fiend's head with a long, contumulous tongue in the chaps on't, a very fit shape for slander if thou perishes. It shall not come so far. Thou understand'st it not. Oh. Oh! He shall die deep enough ere that time, and stick first upon those. Now I conceive you, gardener. Away. List to the privy stamp. That's all thy part. Stamp my horns in a mortar if I miss you, and give the powder in white wine to sick cuckolds, a very present remedy for the headache. Exit. If this should any way miscarry now, as, if the fool be nimble enough, tis certain, the pages that present the swift-winged cupids are taught to hit him with their shafts of love, fitting his part which I have cunningly poisoned. He cannot scape my fury, and those ills will be laid all on fortune, not on our wills. That's all the sport on't, for who will imagine that at the celebration of this night any mischance that haps can flow from spite? Exit. Scene 2. Flourish. Enter above Duke, Bianca, Lord Cardinal, Fabrizio and other cardinals, lords and ladies in state. Now, our fair duchess, your delight shall witness how your beloved and honoured, all the glories bestowed upon the gladness of this night, are done for your bright sake. I am the more in debt, my lord, to loves and courtesies, that offer up themselves so bounteously, to do me honoured grace without my merit. A goodness set in greatness, how it sparkles afar off, like pure diamonds set in gold. How perfect my desires were, might I witness but a fair noble peace twixt your two spirits. 
the reconcilement would be more sweet to me than longer life to him that fears to die. To the Cardinal. Good sir. I profess peace, and am content. I'll see the seal upon it, and then tis firm. You shall have all you wish. I have all indeed now. Aside. But I have made surer work. This shall not blind me. He that begins so early to reprove, quickly rid him, or look for little love. Beware a brother's envy, he's next heir too. Cardinal, you die this night. The plot's laid surely. In time of sports death may steal in securely, then tis least thought on. For he that's most religious, holy friend, does not at all hours think upon his end. He has his times of frailty, and his thoughts, their transportations too, through flesh and blood. For all his zeal, his learning, and his light, as well as we, poor soul, that sin by night. What's this, Fabrizio? Looking at a paper. Marry, my lord, the model of what's presented. Oh, we thank their loves. Sweet Duchess, take your seat. List to the argument. Reads. There is a nymph that haunts the woods and springs in love with two at once, and they with her. Equal it runs, but to decide these things the cause to mighty Juno they refer, she being the marriage goddess. The two lovers they offer sighs, the nymph a sacrifice, all to please Juno, who by sighs discovers how the event shall be, so that strife dies. Then springs a second, for the man refused grows discontent, and out of love abused he raises slander up, like a black fiend, to disgrace the other which pays him i' the end. In troth, my lord, a pretty pleasing argument, and fits the occasion well. Envy and slander are things soon raised against two faithful lovers, but comfort is they're not long unrewarded. Music. This music shows they're upon entrance now. Aside. Then enter all my wishes. Enter Hymen in a yellow robe, Ganymede in a blue robe powdered with stars, and Hebe in a white robe with golden stars, with covered cups in their hands. They dance a short dance, then bowing to the duke and the rest of the company, Hymen speaks, addressing himself to Bianca. To thee, fair bride, Hymen offers up, of nuptial joys this, the celestial cup. Taste it, and thou shalt ever find love in thy bed, peace in thy mind. We'll taste you sure. Twere pity to disgrace so pretty a beginning. Twas spoke nobly. Two cups of nectar have we begged from Jove. Hebe, give that to innocence, I this to love. Take heed of stumbling more, look to your way. Remember still the Via Lactea. Well, Ganymede, you have more faults, though not so known. I spared one cup, but you have filched many a one. Exeunt. But soft, here's no such persons in the argument as these three, Hymen, Hebe, Ganymede. The actors that this model here discovers are only four, Juno, a nymph, two lovers. This is some anti-mask belike, my lord, to entertain time. Now my peace is perfect. Let sports come on apace. Now is their time, my lord. Music. Hark you, you hear from em. The nymphs, indeed. Enter two dressed like nymphs, bearing two tapers lighted. Then Isabella, dressed with flowers and garlands, bearing a censer with fire in it. They set the censer and tapers on Juno's altar with much reverence, this ditty being sung in parts. Juno nuptial goddess, thou that rulest o'er coupled bodies, tiest man to woman, ne'er to forsake her, thou only powerful marriage maker, pity this amazed affection, I love both and both love me nor know i where to give rejection my heart likes so equally 
Till thou settest right my peace of life, And with thy power conclude this strife. Now, with my thanks, depart you to the springs, I to these wells of love, thou sacred goddess, And queen of nuptials, daughter to great Saturn, Sister and wife to Jove, imperial Juno, Pity this passionate conflict in my breast, This tedious war twixt two affections. Crown me with victory, and my heart's at peace. Enter Hippolito and Guardiano dressed like shepherds. Make me that happy man, thou mighty goddess. But I live most in hope, if truest love merit the greatest comfort. I love both with such an even and fair affection, I know not which to speak for, which to wish for. Till thou, great arbitress, twixt lovers' hearts, by thy auspicious grace, design the man, which pity I implore. We, we all, all implore, implore it. it. Livia descends, attired like Juno. And after sighs, contrition's truest odours, I offer to thy powerful deity this precious incense. Scatters incense on the fire. May it ascend peacefully. Aside. And if it keep true touch, my good aunt Juno. Twill try your immortality ere it be long. I fear you'll never get so nigh heaven again once you're down. Though you and your affections seem all as dark to our illustrious brightness as night's inheritance, hell, we pity you, and your requests are granted. You ask signs, they shall be given you, will be gracious to you. He of those twain which we determine for you, love's arrows shall wound twice. The later wound betokens love in age, for so are all whose love continues firmly all their lifetime, twice wounded at their marriage. Else affection dies when youth ends. Oh, this savour overcomes me. Now for a sign of wealth and golden days, bright-eyed prosperity which all couples love, ay, and makes love take that. Our brother Jove never denies us of his burning treasure to express bounty. Isabella sinks down. She falls down upon it. What's the conceit of that? As overjoyed, belike. Too much prosperity overjoys us all, and she has her lap full, it seems, my lord. This swerves a little from the argument, though. Look you, my lords. Aside. All's fast. Now comes my part to toll him hither. Then, with the stamp given, he's dispatched as cunningly. Guardiano falls through a trap door. Start dead. Oh, treachery! Cruelly made away. How's that? Look, there's one of the lovers dropped away too. Why, sure, this plot's drawn false. Here's no such thing. Oh, I am sick to the death. Let me down quickly. This fume is deadly. Oh, it has poisoned me. My subtlety is sped. Her art has quitted me. My own ambition pulls me down to ruin. Falls down and dies. Nay, then I kiss thy cold lips, And applaud this thy revenge in death. Kisses the body of Isabella. Oh, look, Juno's down too. Cupid's shoot at Hippolyto. What makes she there? Her pride should keep aloft. She was wont to scorn the earth in other shows. Methinks her peacock's feathers are much pulled. Oh, death runs through my blood in a wild flame too. Plague of those cupids, some lay hold on them. Let them not escape, they've spoiled me, the shaft's deadly. I have lost myself in this quiet. My great lords, we're all confounded. How? Dead, and I worse. Oh, dead? My girl, dead? I hope my sister Juno has not served me so. Lust and forgetfulness have been amongst us, and we are brought to nothing. Some blessed charity lend me the speeding pity of his sword to quench this fire in blood. 
Leantio's death has brought all this upon us. Now I taste it, and made us lay plots to confound each other. The events so prove it, and man's understanding is riper at his fall than all his lifetime. She, in a madness for her lover's death, revealed a fearful lust in our near bloods, for which I am punished dreadfully and unlooked for. Proved her own ruin, too. Vengeance met vengeance, like a set match, as if the plagues of sin had been agreed to meet here altogether. But how her fawning partner fell I reach not, unless caught by some springe of his own setting, for on my pain he never dreamed of dying. The plot was all his own, and he had cunning enough to save himself. But tis the property of guilty deeds to draw your wise men downward. Therefore the wonder ceases. Oh, this torment! O oh God, below there! Enter a lord with a guard. My lord? Run and meet death, then, and cut off time and pain. Falls on his sword. Behold, my lord, he's run his breast upon a weapon's point. Upon the first night of our nuptial honours, destruction plays her triumph, and great mischiefs mask in expected pleasures. Tis prodigious. They are things most fearfully ominous. I like em not. Remove these ruined bodies from our eyes. Aside. Not yet no change. When falls he to the earth? Please but your excellence to peruse that paper, which is a brief confession from the heart of him that fell first, ere his soul departed. And there the darkness of these deeds speaks plainly. Tis the full scope, the manner, and intent. His ward, that ignorantly led him down, fear put to present flight at the voice of him. Aside. Nor yet? Read, read, for I am lost in sight and strength. Falls. My noble brother. Oh, the curse of wretchedness! My deadly hand is fallen upon my lord. Destruction take me to thee. Give me way, the pains and plagues of a lost soul upon him that hinders me a moment. My heart swells bigger yet. Help! Here break the op. My breast flies open. Next. Dies. Oh, with the poison that was prepared for thee, thee, cardinal, twas meant for thee. Poor prince! A cursed error. Give me thy last breath, thou infected bosom, and wrap two spirits in one poisoned vapour. Thus, thus, reward thy murderer, and turn death into a parting kiss. My soul stands ready at my lips, e'en vexed to stay one minute after thee. Kisses the dead body of the duke. The greatest sorrow and astonishment that ever struck the general peace of Florence dwells in this sour. So my desires are satisfied. I feel death's power within me. Thou hast prevailed in something, cursed poison, though thy chief force was spent in my lord's bosom. But my deformity in spirits more foul, a blemished face best fits a leprous soul. What make I here? These are all strangers to me, not known but by their malice. Now thou art gone, nor do I seek their pities. Stabs herself. Oh, restrain her ignorant, willful hand. Now do, tis done. Leontio, now I feel the breach of marriage at my heart-breaking. Oh, the deadly snares that women set for women, without pity either to soul or honour. Learn by me to know your foes. In this belief I die. Like our own sex, we have no enemy. No enemy. See, my lord, what shift she's made to be her own destruction. Pride, greatness, honours, beauty, youth, ambition. You must all down together. There's no help for it. Yet this my gladness is, that I remove tasting the same death in a cup of love. Dies. Sin, what thou art, these ruins show too piteously. Two kings on one throne cannot sit together, but one must needs down for his title's wrong. So where lust reigns, that prince 
cannot reign long. Exeunt. End of Act Five. End of Women Beware Women by Thomas Middleton.